TikTok, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all around the world. I'm your friendly neighborhood philosopher, David Wood. And with me now, as is very often the case, I have Sam Shamoon, the Assyrian Encyclopedia himself. How, how's it going, Sam? Uh, surviving by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, my brother. And also, for the first time on uh, on this live stream, we have Etta Sham. And uh, Etta Sham, why don't you go ahead, for people who aren't familiar with you, go ahead and um, tell us uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us a little bit about uh, you know your channel and stuff for, for people who might be interested. Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Etta Sham Gulam. I've been a Muslim apologist for, what, like, more than 10 years now. I've been in two debates. Uh, I don't even consider that James White thing a debate. I don't, I don't know what that was, but I've been in two debates, one with you, one with Mary Jo Sharp back in, uh, uh, back, what, 11 years ago. Um, you know, that was my favorite debate, the, the second one I did with Mary Jo Sharp. Um, you know, uh, so over the years, I've revised my position. I've, uh, I've read conservative scholars. I've read, uh, uh, you know, uh, people like Richard Buckham, uh, uh, what's it, uh, Raymond Brown, et cetera, et cetera. So I revised my position over the years. I'm still a Muslim, but I've left the Salafi movement. I, I used to be a Salafi, but I left because it was just too extreme. So I'm just, you know, Sunni Orthodox Muslim at, at this point. Uh, you know, I got my bachelor's, uh, I got my bachelor's from Wayne State University. Um, you know, I work at a hospital. Um, you know, and as you can see, I'm a big comic book fan from my action figures and uh, things like that. So, uh, so uh, yeah, that's pretty much my uh, my background. And my channel is Answering Christians One. If you want to leave a link or something, uh, I'm not in the live chat, but if you want to uh, give a shout out to my channel, um, could uh, could, uh, could hey one of the uh, one of the moderators um, l uh, please look up uh, Itta Sham's um, channel, Answering Christians One, and leave a link there for anyone who wants the link. Um, all right, let me give you just a, uh, uh, give everyone a quick idea of the format. So this is Muhammad Week. Uh, we'll probably be having other weeks in the future where we invite people to join us live for discussions. Um, since this is Muhammad Week, we are inviting pretty much any Muslim who wants to come on here and have a discussion with us. The, the basic overall format would be we would give you time at the beginning to make a case for Muhammad. And so different Muslims will have different reasons for believing in Muhammad. And we would be happy to give you an opportunity to share your specific reasons. And so the idea is we will give um, a Muslim participant or if, if you know two Muslims want to join at the same time, that's fine as well. But uh, Muslims can come on, make their case for Muhammad, and then afterwards we'll have a, a friendly discussion uh, about those. So this is not a this is not a, a formal debate with you know full rebuttals and things like that. More of a uh, you know give one presentation and then a discussion about that presentation. So we're going to go back we're going to go back and forth. Uh, Etishem can clarify his points. Um, Sam can address those. If I have questions, I'll I'll ask questions. But I'm I'm basically going to be since since his. Since there's two Christians and one Muslim here, I'll, I'll focus on more of more of being a moderator or something like that. But if I, you know, if I have a question, I'll, I'll jump in and, and then Etoshem will will be given time. Uh, but the idea is Etoshem will have uh, will have uh, plenty of time to talk about any uh, any points he wants to address. All right, everyone, clear on all of that. If so, then Etoshem, if you have your um, if you want to go through some of your reasons for believing in Muhammad, we're 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 ready for that. All right. So, um, like I said, I've uh, revised my position over the years. Uh, you know, I used to cite liberals and atheists and things like that. And people would always point the finger saying that, well, you're pointing the finger at Christianity. Well, three fingers are pointing back at you because those arguments can be thrown back against Islam. So I've read conservative scholars. I've read evangelical scholars. Uh, you know, I bought some evangelical books uh, from, you know, Dan Wallace, et cetera, et cetera. And I actually found out that there were serious issues uh, with the Bible. Uh, and I'll get to how that connects to the Prophet of Muhammad in a second. So, like, uh, another thing I, I forgot to mention is at one point I was considering leaving Islam for Christianity. At one point, uh, then I read the conservative literature, uh, you know, or the conservative authors and things like that. And even they admit that there were, there were issues 
here. So if you guys want to clarify that up in the Q&A, you can uh, do that. So how does this connect back to Muhammad? You're saying, what does this have to do with the Prophet Muhammad? Well, first of all, what is the need? Why was Muhammad sent to begin with? Why couldn't Revelation just end with Jesus, like Christians say? Uh, well, there was a need. Uh, my view is that there was a need for a final prophet. Uh, if you read the Quran, chapter 5, uh, verse 13 to 15, it says the Jews had a covenant, but they messed it up. The Christians had a covenant, but they forgot the good part of the message. Now has come a messenger revealing what used to hide in your scriptures and things like that. This is the Quran, chapter 5, verse 13 through 15. So if you read Tafsir Ibn Kathir, Ibn Kathir is a uh, important commentator on the Quran. He talks about how this... These verses are clearly point, our prophet moment is saying that the Jews and Christians have corrupted their scriptures. So then we need to really validate, well, is that true or not? Or is moment just making this stuff up? Uh, so, you know, I, I read, uh, well, let's go to the Old Testament because the Quran has specific, uh, uh, the Quran says that the Bible, the Old Testament, is, uh, or the, the scriptures of the Jews is corrupt. In the Quran chapter 2, verse 75, Quran chapter 2, verse 79, Quran chapter 3, verse uh, 78, Quran chapter 3, verse 187, Quran chapter 5, verse 13 to 14, uh, as confirmed in Tafsir and Kathir, Quran chapter 6, verse uh, 91, uh, etc., etc. And the Prophet Muhammad said that Jews and Christians have corrupted their scriptures in uh, Mujah al Kabir, volume 8, page, uh, uh, th uh, page 31, Ahmed ibn Humble, volume 4, page 381. So is this is this valid? Is is what Mom is saying correct, or is he just making stuff up just to, uh, you know, validate his prophethood? And so I I read, like I said, I read conservative scholars, I read uh, Judeo-Christian scholars, while ignoring the atheist. I used to cite I used to cite Barterman, and Richard Carrier, et cetera, et cetera. You know, these liberal atheist scholars. But I don't do that anymore, uh, in the name of to be try to be consistent uh, or fair with the Christian scriptures. But anyways, if we read Jeremiah chapter eight, verse eight, uh, in the in the Living English Bible, or in the Bible in Living English, page nine, it says Jeremiah chapter eight, verse eight, is speaking about the fact that the text of the Torah during Jeremiah's day was so corrupt that he can say that falsehood has been deliberately put into it. And it would be hard for us to prove that the text we have today it's not the same one Jeremiah was invented. And if you read it, Adam Cole is concentrated on Jeremiah being cut in the Hit the shim. Uh, did, it, did a fan or something just come on? Well, you can hear me because his voice is uh, cutting off. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're, you're. What is that? Yeah, what's worse is that his voice cut off. So you're saying something about yeah, Jeremiah I could, being I couldn't hear. Broken. I couldn't hear you because it, uh, something got really loud. Wait, now it went away. It sounds like it sounds like a loud fan or air conditioner or something came on. Yeah, no, hold on. It's uh, that's uh, it's mine. I'm going to turn off. But his mic cut off when he was talking. With, so he's, so I'm going to turn off. But hold on. Yeah, turn yours turn yours off, Sam, just so I can see what the noise is. Okay, that might that might have been from Sam. Okay. Yeah, but, what's my thing? Yeah, but anyway, his sound went off. Yeah, hence me. Well, your sound is probably drowning it out because you guys are coming through the same same uh, same I mic. I, hence me telling I you over I and over again, yourself. silence your mic. You didn't. <laughs> okay, now you're silenced. Now you're silenced. Now you're good. All right, go ahead, continue, it's Sam. All right. Uh, uh, you might you, you might yeah you might want to back it up. It was only it was only like ten seconds or so when I well at, after hearing the noise. So just yeah just back up a little bit. All right. So I'll just talk about Jeremiah eight eight uh, chapter eight verse eight real quick. Okay. So basically, the corruption of the Bible, um, you know, proves the case for the proper moment. Uh, in the in the by in the Bible, the Living English page nine, it says Jeremiah chapter eight verse eight is talking about the fact that the text of the Torah uh, during uh, dur uh, during the day of Jeremiah was so corrupt, he can say falsehood has been deliberately put in it. Uh, and it would be hard for us to prove that the text we have today is the same one Jeremiah was condemning. So basically, uh, you know, Adam Clark's commentary also confirms this. Adam Clark was a uh, Protestant scholar and things like that. So basically, Judeo-Christian scholars are saying that Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 8, is talking about the corruption of the Torah, corruption of the, 
uh, previous books. So this validates Mormon's claim that the Bible is uh, corrupt and uh, things like that. Uh, now, in unknown authorship of the New Testament, we have, uh, uh, for example, Raymond Brown in his book, Introduction to the New Testament, talks about, you know, how the Gospels are, were originally anonymous, and later on people put those names, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in there, in page 158, 208, to uh, 267. Uh, again, Craig L. Blomberg says that the Gospels are anonymous in a, uh, unknown authorship. In Lee Strobel, The Case for Christ, page 23. Uh, the Oxford Annotated Bible, page 20, uh, 2113. The authorship of Hebrews is anonymous. One John is anonymously attributed uh, on page two, uh, 2137, et cetera, et cetera. And Bruce Metzger in his book, uh, uh, The New Testament, its corruption, its transmission, corruption, and restoration. Uh, says that, you know, talks about textual people adding things into the Bible, taking it out, like the whole uh, Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verse 9 through uh, 20, and things like that. So people were adding things, taking things out of the Bible. So I think this validates Mormon's claim that the Bible is corrupt or, or corrupted or at least edited, uh, because as Judeo Christian scholars themselves are admitting this, uh, you know, and. Uh, uh, so, like, basically, this is one of the reasons I think Muhammad was sent to to tell people to go back to the teachings, the true teachings of the God of Abraham, without following these distorted books, as you know, the Judeo-Christian history and scholars have have shown. So then, the question really arises: uh, Well, what is the biblical criteria of a prophet? Because David Wood and Sam Shimon are Christians, so they follow the Bible. Uh, I'm guessing they're Protestant Christians, so they follow, you know, the 66 books of the Bible, et cetera, et cetera. So what is the criteria of a prophet? Uh, according to the Bible, according to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 13, verse 18, he must command the people to worship the God they know. Did the prophet Muhammad do that? Yes. He said, worship one God, the God of the Jews. And the uh, another, another criteria is getting food. Event, uh, or miracle. Uh, it, it, just one, just one, yeah. just one second. You're breaking up there for a second. So normally, normally that's just a little. Uh, uh, go back to uh, after you after you mentioned biblical criteria of a prophet. You started you started breaking up a little bit. Should be should be fine. That normally there's normally just a breakups last a couple of seconds there. So just just repeat that part and then move and then go ahead. You you, you mentioned. You mentioned biblical Which, criteria of a prophet, and then you started breaking up a little bit when you were when you were going through your first point. So, oh, okay, uh, yeah. So the biblical criteria for a prophet is he must command the people to worship the God they know. Deuteronomy chapter thirteen, verse eighteen. The prophet Muhammad did that. Uh, give a true prophecy of a future event or miracle. Deuteronomy chapter thirteen, verse eighteen. The prophet Muhammad did that. Uh, not claim to be the Messiah or Elijah. Gospel of John, the prophet Muhammad, uh, did that. So again, we need to know, we need to biblical criteria for prophet because, you know, there are a lot of Christians watching and, um, uh, you know, we're, we're judging Muhammad from the Bible, at least, uh, uh, you know, for the sake of simplicity. So, uh, so we need to look at what the Bible says and or judge Muhammad according to uh, the Bible. Um, you know, so, uh, so then, uh, they, they, uh, now, for some some might say, yeah, I is the name of God, and Allah is not the name of God. But the problem is that, that it's not in the New Testament, it's replaced with the Greek word kurios. Kurios means Lord. So not even the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament say Yahweh of the Tetramethyl ground. It's a kurios. So if Christians want to say Mormon's a false prophet because he didn't say Yahweh, well, Testament, the, the New Testament fails that very test. Uh, the, the New Testament does not say that word. It says as uh, simple as uh, that. So some of the prophecies of Prophet Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad gave many prophecies. Uh, it's found in Sayyid Bukhari, Book 2, uh, uh, number 48, or uh, Bukhari, Book uh, 50. I don't have time to go all over them, but all uh, over all of them, but I'll give just you know two examples. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad said that before the end of the world, there'll be you know, Arabs building tall buildings, and we see see this happening today in Bahrain, uh, Saudi Arabia, Dubai. It's uh, Sayyid Bukhari, Volume 1, Book 2, page 48, Bukhari, uh, uh, Book Number 50, Fire in the Land of Hijaz, 
the prophet Muhammad said that a fire will take place, uh, uh, you know, towards the end of time, and it'll, it'll go all the way to uh, Basra, which is modern-day Iraq. And this prophecy actually did come true. Sahih Bukhari, Book 9, page 152, Hadith uh, 7118. Uh, you know, so, and then the prophet, the miracles of Muhammad, what, what miracle, what mir- uh, you know, uh, Ibn Kathir's biography, Prophet Muhammad healed people, somebody was blind, the Prophet Muhammad healed them, Prophet Muhammad split the moon in half, and Sayyid Bukhari 3637, uh, Sayyid Muslim 2802, Termini 3289, etc., etc. So we see that Prophet Muhammad did prophecies, he did miracles, um, etc. Uh, so um, so these are uh, some of the proofs of the uh, of the Prophet Muhammad, or, you know, how he fits into a criteria of being a prophet. You know, we see prophecies being fulfilled, we see miracles, there are prophecies of the Quran, and there's uh, scientific accuracy in the Quran, but just to save time, if, in the Q&A, if people want to hear that, I can I can do that, but just to save time, uh, you know, I'm just trying, I'm going to try to skip over that. So then, the question really arises, um, what about the moral issues, right? What Did Muhammad do bad things? Did he do things that uh, people would say, according to the biblical criteria, uh, did he do bad things that would invalidate him from being a uh, prophet? Um, you know, so, but as uh, uh, Christians will say, Mormon was immoral because he did this, yada, 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 that. Uh, so, uh, my question is, what standards are you using against the prophet Mormon's morality? Because both, whatever Mormon did, both the Old New Testaments have the same morals or they have worse morals than what the prophet Mormon did. Um, you know, so if you're saying prophet wage war that invalidates him from being a prophet well moses fought wars too so does that invalidate him from being a prophet keep in mind that uh you know we're we're judging moment from the bible we're not judging him from atheist standards and uh things like uh things like that um you know uh let's see what else so then so we gotta we gotta judge the moral issues well, well when you go into morality i think there's a subjective argument i think uh, you know, people like David Wood can agree with me that this can be a subjective argument and uh, things like uh, things like that. So then, uh, what about was Muhammad sincere in what he was doing? And I think he was. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad, where he had to give all his money in charity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the Prophet Muhammad had no reason to invent a religion like Islam. Um, you know, that's just my that's just my uh, my thoughts on this. Prophet Muhammad suffered and even faced death to spread Islam. Here, uh, a non-Muslim writer, uh, Montgomery Watt and William Moyer, uh, uh, concluded that Prophet Muhammad was sincere. He wasn't lying to the people, saying, you know, this book uh, this book is coming to him from you know the divine realm or from God and stuff like that. Also, the Quran corrects the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, so, if the Muhammad was really making up the Quran, why would he author a book that criticizes himself. It doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, so did Prophet Muhammad plagiarize? Did Muhammad plagiarize off Jews and Christians? I don't think so, because like I said before, uh, Prophet Muhammad believed uh, that the Jews and Christians have corrupted their scriptures. So if he believed they corrupted their scriptures, why would he plagiarize them? Plagiarize off them? It doesn't make any sense. And uh, when the Quran mentions stories that you can find in these Jewish or Christian apocryphal sources, that doesn't mean the Quran's copying. It just means that you know they could come from the same source, or there could be some historical veracity uh, towards them and uh, things like that. What about self-serving verses? Did Prophet Muhammad make up the Quran, uh, you know, to to have some kind of self-serving motive and things like that. Uh, I think that's a fallacious argument. It's called the fallacy of circumstantial ad hominem. Uh, so it's a fallacious argument to say Prophet Muhammad made up the Quran and uh, things like that. Uh, they'll argue, well, how come Prophet Muhammad had more than four wives? Or, uh, you know, they'll, they'll bring that up, uh, saying, isn't that self-serving? Well, the, the issue is that uh, the problem is that the polygamy was already established before Islam. Uh, you know, so... Uh, um, so he, even though the prophet had special privileges, he also had restrictions, uh, too. And uh, the wives of the prophet Muhammad are, are spiritual mothers uh, in the Quran, chapter 33, verse uh, 6, um, et cetera, et cetera. So was Muhammad demon-possessed? People would say, well, maybe he was just demon-possessed, or maybe Angel Gabriel became a demon or something like that. I don't think so. Um, you know, if you read the book of Daniel, chapter 8, verse 16, Angel Gabriel brings revelation. Uh, you know, and he has a terrifying uh, presence. 
you know, um, uh, uh, Book of Daniel, chapter 8, verse 17, Book of Luke, chapter 2, chapter 1, verse 12, etc., uh, so what the prophet Muhammad saw matches um, what the Bi what the Bible says about angels bringing revelation and uh, things like that. Um, but you know, critics will say, well, Muhammad thought he saw a demon in the cave, and doesn't that uh, mean that uh, you know he's uh, he was demon possessed or tricked by Satan and uh, things like that? I don't think so. Um, you know, I think uh, I think that was the real angel Gabriel that he uh, uh, that he saw. Uh, let's see here. What else I want to say? Uh, it's been about uh, it's been yeah. it's been about sixteen minutes, but we had a, we had a couple minutes of technical difficulties. But I think we're clearly over ten. So if you want to just give a kind of final statement right now on this, and then we'll then we'll jump into a discussion. All right. So the sources of the Prophet Muhammad. Let me just talk about that. A lot of critics will use Ibn Ishaq, Al Waqi, Ibn Saad, Al Tabari. Uh, you know, the problem is none of those sources are reliable. Ibn Ishaq is not reliable as well. Uh, Ahmad Ibn Humble and Imam Malik have uh, said that Ibn Ishaq is careless in compiling information. In fact, I have Ibn Ishaq's book right here, and in the beginning of the book, there are scholars who say why it's not authentic. So this is mainly not an authentic uh, book. I don't know if people can see that or not. Uh, al Waqidi was also known to be a liar by Muslim scholars. Ibn Saad was a weak source. al Dabari, Volume 6 to Volume 9, talks about the life of the Prophet Muhammad. The problem is al Dabari warns people those books are filled with weak, inauthentic narrations. And uh, al Dabari, Volume 1, page 170 to 171. So Ibn, so you might be saying, what is the authentic biography? It's Ibn Hisham, Volume 1 to Volume 6. And then we have Hadith, Bukhari, Sahih, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, Dermidi, etc. Then we have Hadith commentaries that the critics don't use. Um, so uh, so that's the sources of Islam and stuff like that. So that's my case for a well, moment. There was a lot of other things, but because of time, I can't get into it. All right. Thank you, uh, Itasham. And Sam, if you want to unmute your mic. So um, looks like we have a couple, uh, well, several things we could uh, we could take a look at. Uh, Itasham opened his um, case by pointing out that uh, Muhammad affirms the corruption of the Jewish and Christian scriptures, and the evidence bears that out and shows that Muhammad was right. Uh, we have Muhammad fulfilling biblical criteria of a prophet, such as delivering fulfilled prophecies and performing um, miracles. We have the scientific accuracy of the Quran. Etishem didn't go into detail, but he said uh, he could if people want to in, in the chat. Um, he said, uh, as far as moral problems with Muhammad, then if we're judging Muhammad by the standards of the Bible, well, obviously prophets in the Bible did some bad things as well. Um, he argued that Muhammad was sincere, uh, that Muhammad didn't plagiarize, that, um, uh, and that a lot of criticisms against Muhammad are drawn from weak sources. So that is a lot to cover. Uh, Sam, should we, should we start with... Should we start with the corruption of the Bible, or, or better, even before that, uh, Itasham's first point was that Muhammad affirmed the um, the corruption of the Bible. Now, Itasham, one one quick uh, question, because you did give a number of verses. I didn't I didn't write down the verses that you yeah. mentioned from the from the Quran, which say that the Bible has been corrupted. But I remember you referencing some verses. Uh, could you could you kind of uh, give us the ones you think are most are most clear and then and then sam can all right oh uh, yeah uh the quran chapter 2 verse 75 quran chapter 2 uh verse 9 quran chapter 3 verse 78 quran chapter 3 verse 100 187 uh quran chapter 5 verse 13 through 15 through 14 talks about the corruption of the scriptures of the jews and christians as confirmed by tafsir ibn kathir a uh, quran chapter 6 verse uh uh, uh, 91. And if you want to know why, uh, what the Quran's talking about by the Torah and the Injil, I can I can get into that if if you want. Okay, um, Sam, would uh, yeah. Do you want to go through some of these? Because uh, um, sure, uh, I know we, 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 we yeah we have a we have a we have a slight mix up of styles because Sam likes to mainly ask questions, whereas Etishem prefers you know each person each person has his time. What is that? What is that noise? That's not me. That's you. That's you, That's Sam. All right. Um, so anyway, there's uh, Sam. Sam normally prefers uh, pressing questions, and Etshem prefers kind of you know just just uh, mm -hmm. going back and forth, making points. So Sam. Um, yes. Oh, that was me. Sorry, that, that was me. That was my phone. Okay. I'm sorry. That's fine. I, I don't. If, 
That, no, no, no. That that that's uh, I, I I can't recall many uh, shows I've I've live streams I've done where there there's not some sort of technical difficulties. But uh, yeah, there's there's okay. often there's often beeping and buzzing and things like that from uh from various devices. All right, Sam. On the issue of yeah. What the Quran says about the Bible. Go ahead and go ahead and, and share yes. your thoughts. And if you want, if sure. you want me to pull up any verses for you, I can. Other sure. than that, I'll, I'll probably yeah, stay him. out of it. Yeah, yeah. Notice what he did here. He says that Muhammad confirms the corruption of Scripture, but then he appealed to the Bible to prove that Muhammad is a prophet. Classic uh, case of circular reasoning. Did you guys hear what he said? Yeah, Muhammad confirmed that the Bible is corrupt, and he quoted certain evangelical scholars out of context. He quoted Craig Blomberg out of context, and I'm going to press him on that to quote Blomberg in context, so make sure you have his book ready with the page number so we can read in context what Blomberg actually said. But guys, hear it. This is the beauty of Islamic apologetics. Muhammad confirms the Bible is corrupt, and Muhammad is a prophet because he fulfills biblical criteria for prophethood. So a corrupt Bible confirms that Muhammad is a true prophet who then confirms that the Bible is corrupt. Masterful. I mean, honestly, I think this was going to convince many people to take Shahada. But every passage that you quoted from the Quran was misquoted. None of those passages, and this is why I want to engage you, say that Muhammad taught the Bible is corrupt. Now, I'm going to just go to chapter 2 of the Quran, and I want you to write these down at Tisham, because these are your verses from the same chapter, chapter 2 that you're gonna to have to address in context because you misquoted 275, you took it out of context. Write down chapter two, verses 40 to 44. So I'm gonna repeat it again. Chapter two, verses 40 to 44. Chapter two, verse 89, 91. Chapter two, verse 89, 91. Chapter two, verse 97. Chapter two, verse 101. Chapter two, verse 113. Chapter two, verse 136. And that's just in chapter two. Again, you misquoted chapter 3, verse 78 of the Quran. You wrenched it out of context, as well as chapter 3, verse 187. So here I'm going to ask you to write down chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Write these down, because you're going to have to engage these texts. Your own Quran, which you quoted out of context to make it say something you didn't. Chapter 3 of the Quran, verses 3 to 4. Write that down. Chapter 3, verse 48. Chapter 3, verse 50. Chapter 3, verse 48. Chapter 3, verse 50. Write that down. Chapter 3, verse 113 to 114. Chapter 3, verses 113 to 114. Then he went to chapter 5 and misquoted chapter 5, verse 13 out of context to make it say something that the context says it cannot be saying unless you believe the Quran is full of contradictions. And it is, but for other reasons. So write down chapter 5 of the Quran, verses 43 to 48. Chapter 5, verses 43 to 48. So I'm repeating it twice. Chapter 5, verse 66, and chapter 5, verse 68. Write those passages down. And then again, you did it with chapter 6, verse 91. You again quoted it out of context. So again, I'm going to help you read your own Quran in context. Go to chapter 6 of the Quran, verses 114 and 115. 6, 114 and 115. And unlike you, I'd like to engage these texts and read them to see what they say. But for the sake of time, 6, verses 114 and 115. And then add these as brownie points. Chapter 10, verse 7, 37 of the Quran. Chapter 10, verse 37 of the Quran. Chapter 10, verse 94 of the Quran. Chapter 12, verse 111 of the Quran. Add that. Chapter 12, verse 111 of the Quran. Then add chapter 15, verse 9 of the Quran. Chapter 15, verse 9. Cross-reference that with chapter 16, verse 43 of the Quran. Chapter 16, verse 43 of the Quran. And chapter 21, verse 7 of the Quran. And then icing on the cake. Chapter 46, verse 12, and verse 30 of the Quran. Chapter 46, verse 12, verse 30 of the Quran. All of which say that one of the proofs that your prophet was a true prophet, it's not that he confirmed the Bible's corrupt. He actually confirmed the Bible was incorruptible, that the scriptures are preserved and authoritative and to be used to judge Muhammad and also to live according to their dictates. So you're wrong. Muhammad did not say the Bible is corrupt. That's your misreading of the Quran, which is why you had to run to Ibn Kathir. But when did Ibn Kathir come? He didn't come in the time of your prophet. He didn't even come in the 9th century, nor did he come in the 10th century. Ibn Kathir is about 700 years removed from the time that your prophet died. So talk about being desperate. You have to go to someone who comes about 700 years later, who assumes that the Bible is corrupt, and then he misreads the passages like you do to prove biblical corruption. But conveniently, you didn't mention Ibn Qayyim, because both Ibn Qayyim and Ibn Kathir were both students of Ibn Taymiyyah. But Ibn Qayyim says that even at his time, there are a group of scholars, Muslim scholars, who say that at least in the case of the Torah, the Torah is incorruptible. Why? Because they use chapter 6, verse 115 to prove. It says, none changing the words of Allah. And Ibn Qayyim said that those scholars, Ibn uh, Qayyim, said those scholars use that verse to show because the Torah is the word of Allah, it cannot be changed. Those same scholars, Muslim scholars, at the same time, contemporary with Ibn Kathir, 
quoted this hadith from Abu Dawood. Abu Dawood, in the English it's number 44, verse 34, narrated Abdullah ibn Umar, a group of Jews came and invited the Apostle of Allah to Kuf. So he visited them in their school. They said, Abu Qasim, one of our men has committed fornication with a woman. So pronounce judgment upon them. They placed the cushion for the Apostle of Allah, who sat on it and said, bring the Torah. It was then brought, their copy of the Torah. He took it and he says, he then withdrew the cushion from beneath him, placed the Torah on it and said, I believe in you and him who revealed you. Ibn Qayyim, not me, not David Wood, said, the scholars of Islam, no. the scholars of Islam. I hear somebody talking no, to my... Who's talking? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm okay. sorry. Yeah, it's not. Please okay. don't talk okay. over me. I didn't do that with you at the Sham. All right. Anyway, listen. The scholars of Islam said he would not have said, I believe in the Torah and in him who revealed it, it was corrupted. So you selectively cite those scholars that agree with you, but then you ignore the scholars who refute you. And the scholars I cite that refute you, they're right because the Quran agrees. The Bible is incorruptible and it is the standard to judge Muhammad. And you even implicitly agreed. Why? Because you went to the biblical criteria to prove he's a prophet. Why would you, if you're not assuming that Muhammad has to live up to the criteria of the biblical revelation, but he fails miserably? Because why does he fail? I'm going to use the very passages you cite against you. You mentioned Deuteronomy 13. You said that a criteria, one of the criteria to prove that someone is a prophet, he must preach the same God. Sorry to burst your bubble. Muhammad did not preach the same God of Deuteronomy, which is why you're not going to say it's corrupt. But when you say it's corrupt, you prove my point. Muhammad is a false prophet, which is why you have to argue biblical corruption. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 1, it says that the Israelites are the sons of God. Deuteronomy 14, verse 1. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 6, it says that God is their spiritual father who spiritually begot them. And Deuteronomy 32, 18 to 20 says that he is the rock that gave them birth spiritually, not physically, because God is not a physical being. And they are his sons and daughters who proved perverse. The same Pentateuch, because Deuteronomy is part of the collection called Pentateuch. In Exodus 4, verse 22, it says that Israel is my firstborn. Let my son go to worship me. And if you don't let my firstborn go, go I'll kill your firstborn. God speaking through Moses to Pharaoh. So according to that very book, the God of Moses is a spiritual father to the Israelites. The Israelites are his sons and daughters that he gave birth spiritually to. But your prophet, your Muhammad, in chapter 5, verse 18 says, the Jews are not the sons of Allah, neither are the Christians. Your prophet, your Muhammad said, that no one is a son to Allah. The highest relationship they can have with your God is a slave to master relationship. Chapter 19, verses 88 to 93. So the very Deuteronomy 13, you cited, so you can't now backpedal, condemns Muhammad as a false prophet, as an antichrist. And then you had the audacity to go to John 1. My goodness, you went to John 1 saying, another criteria to prove that a prophet is a true prophet, he denies that he's Elijah, and he's the, he denies he's the Christ. That is a gross perversion of John 119 to 25. There is no criterion given in John 119 to 25. What it's saying is to John the Baptist, are you the Elijah? No. Are you the Christ? No. Are you the prophet? No. That's all it's saying. But it's ironic you use John 1. Now you're stuck with it at Tisham. You better not backpedal and tell me it's corrupt. Because that's the same John where John the Baptist said that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That Jesus Christ is the Son of God who is before me and greater than I, who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And that Jesus Christ is the Jehovah of Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3. All of which you deny and the prophet deny. So according to John 1, Muhammad is a false prophet and antichrist condemned the pit of hell according to John 1 who quoted it so I want you to say you agree with John 1 that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world that he's the Son of God who baptizes with the Holy Spirit and that he's Jehovah of Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3 because that's what John the Baptist says in that very chapter that you quoted out of context now I don't know how much more time I have David because um, I will have a field day with this at a point. yeah I, I know you could yeah it's uh, I know basically Etishem, Etishem brought up a bunch of points and I know you would have something to to say on Let's all of these see. points but I kind of like to uh, probably go through one point at a time. So, uh, right. Itisham, on that, well, I'm the Bible. yeah, on that, on that first point, uh, it's the first point you brought up, Itisham, and then Sam, um, Sam brought up a number of uh, brought up a number of verses and um, commentary on why he doesn't believe that the Quran affirms the corruption of the Bible. Uh, 
if you if you like if you'd like to respond if you'd like to respond to that particular issue i know there i know he said lots of other things but we can kind of go through those one at a time so on this particular issue of what muhammad thought about the bible what did you what would your response to sam be there's some mic problem. There's some. Yeah, mic yeah, I, 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 yeah. It's very bad. I, I noticed it before we started, but it's only it's only when he starts. It's, it sounds like his his phone adjusts, right? So it starts off loud, and yeah. then it, and then it and then it goes back. It goes what back was over. happening to me when I was speaking? Yeah. I kept hearing it. About... Oh. I'm sorry. I don't know what the yeah. what the issue it's is. No it's no problem. You're I'm good now. My phone. You're good now. Mm -hmm. So basically, my question is, Sam, why whenever, uh, why whenever. Why do you keep bringing up points? This is my sincere question to you. I'm not trying to belittle you. I'm not trying to be mean-spirited or anything like that. But my sincere question to you, right, from a believer to another believer, is why do you keep bringing up points that have already been refuted by others? Like Shabir Ali already refuted that argument back in your debate, uh, what, 20 years ago. Basant Fawadi has also refuted that stuff. So why do you keep bringing up these already refuted stuff. This whole uh, Quran endorsing the Bible or Islam endorsing the Bible is dead. It's gone. Okay, it's can I answer now? Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, let me answer that. Uh, yeah, my challenge to you is show me where they refuted any of my points. To say they refuted is one thing. To prove it is another. In fact, I have an open challenge to Shabir and Bassam. Let's debate the issue because he didn't refute me back then and he won't refute me now. So instead of appealing to Shabir, who didn't do well in the debate, now you're gonna say, well, that's subjective. You think he did. So let's not bring that in. You think he did well, I think he got decimated, which is why I'm still chasing him for a debate. And you know that, because you were in his Facebook page when I called him out. Instead of telling me what Bassam Zawadi did, because I have a series of responses to Bassam Zawadi. I hope you've read them. Give me the arguments they brought up to see where they refuted me, and I promise you, I'll put that to bed they haven't refuted what your prophet said, and you forgot what I said, Itisham. It's not my argument. Ibn Qayyim, who's not a Christian or a Jew, said Muslims of his day use the Quran, the same verses that David and I use to prove that the Bible's not corrupt, specifically the Torah. So I don't know what you're talking about. Give me a concrete example. Let's deal with it. Give me the verse. All right, so let's deal with the whole Torah, the prophet confirming the Torah mm -hmm. uh, hadith. That hadith is actually a week because you don't... Uh, no, uh, no. You're, you're going to a weak source anyways. Abu Dawood you know, does have weak hadith in it, um, you know, like the whole sun, sun setting and the muddy spring. That's a weak hadith that was accurately classified as Sa'i and things like that. And if you want the scholars who say that... It's yeah, give it to me, because I have Al-Albani saying it's not weak. So are you making things up? I have it right here. Yeah. Sunnah.com. Well, well, let me make my comment. Tisham, let me make my comment. On uh, Sunnah.com, it gives the grading. It's not Da'if. Give me the grading. That's Al Albani's uh, classification. Secondly, are you telling me that Ibn Khayyim, now I want you to answer this, is an ignoramus who is a moron? And the scholars he cited were ignoramuses and morons because he said the scholars quoted this hadith from Abu Dawood to prove that the Torah is not corrupt. And are you saying that Ibn Kathir, whom you cited, is another idiot? Because if you go to Tafsir Ibn Kathir, open it up, chapter 5, verse 41, in him, he cites that hadith. And he doesn't say it's weak. So now I'm going to call out your bluff. Give me the name of the scholar that says this is Daif. It cannot be used. Ibn Qayyim and the scholars of his day said it's not Daif. Ibn Kathir. Open it up. I have it in front of me. You have it with you? Open it up. Chapter 5, verse 41. He cites the Hadith. and doesn't say it's Daif. So why are you making up the classifications as you go along? All right. Now Sam, Sam go, let, let, oh. let, let, let Etisham finish, finish his response here. Okay, good. All right. You let me know when you want me to respond yeah. then. Well, I mean, uh, like I said, this whole argument is dead. Like, Muslims have already refuted it. But Ibn Hazm, in his book, uh, al Fisil, Al-Malil, Al-Walal, Al-Mahil, Volume 1, page 237, I know I butchered the Arabic, but even he says that, uh, you know, it's a fabricated report that reached us with false, without a proper chain of transmission. So he, Ibn Hazm says that Hadith is weak anyways. Uh, you know, so even if you want to think it's authentic or whatever, according to Ibn Hajar, who, you know, I know it's saying it refers to the original Torah that was revealed to Moses. That's not the Old Testament. That's some uh, revealed scripture revealed to Moses. So, you know, so scholars have different interpretations of that. It doesn't mean what you want it to mean. It's not, it's not even authentic according to some Muslim scholars anyways. So, uh, you know. 
Are, you want me to address it now? Uh, I, I just I just wanted to clarify. You, I just wanted to clarify because there there will there are viewers who don't know what you guys are talking about right now. So to be clear, you're talking about the hadith from Sunan Abu Dawood right now, from the, the one that where where yes. Muhammad tells the Jews to bring him a copy of the Torah. Is that, is that the, you're both addressing that one, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So so everyone just okay, let me just, just yeah just yeah. let me tell people what that hadith is about, and then they can understand what the what the dispute is about. In in that hadith. The Jews uh, are having a dispute about um, about uh, they want Muhammad to judge a dispute they're having. Muhammad tells them to bring a copy of the Torah, and then Muhammad uh, sits on a kind of judgment cushion that signifies that he's the judge in the dispute. So he tells the judge to bring the I mean he tells the Jews to bring a Torah. The Jews bring him a copy of the Torah, and Muhammad says, "I believe in you and in the one who revealed you." after putting the uh, the torah on the judgment cushion so the suggestion is that the um that the the torah is their actual judge and so uh the perspective of people who say that uh that muhammad affirmed the reliability of the jewish scriptures is that well muhammad said he believes in in the torah there and he's talking about a physical copy that existed during the time um of of the seventh century and so, and so the, the the criticism would be, well, what's he really talking about there? Uh, is he is he just affirming the Torah, or is he affirming the entire Old Testament? And then, in addition to that, is the is that hadith reliable? So, is that a real situation that Muhammad actually said that in? And that's kind of that's kind of the issue. Yeah. That's that's kind of the that, that's the issue they're discussing. I just wanted people to understand what what you guys are talking about right now. Okay. Now, can I address him? Yeah. Okay, guys, I just gave you the classification, sunnah.com. It's not run by Christians or Jews. The grade of this hadith, you can go to sunnah.com.com backslash Abu Dawood backslash 40 backslash 99. I'll give you the link and we'll put it in the description box because I can't post links right now. Grade, Hassan al-Albani. If you guys don't know who al-Albani is, Muslim scholars, specifically the Salafi, consider him to be one of the greatest not scholars of the 20th century sheikh el albani hassan that means it's good it's not daif even daif doesn't mean it's not true because then i'm gonna have to talk about the classification how even sunni scholars say daif means passing it's it passed but this is hassan that's number one number two ibn kathir whom you cited you cited ibn kathir open up to his exposition of chapter 5 verse 41 i have him it's in my articles that you claim was refuted far from it they failed to refute anything glory to jesus christ 541 ibn kathir cites the same hadith to explain the context of chapter 5 surat al-maida when the jews came to him for judgment and he doesn't say it's forged or it's weak but beyond that ibn qayyim companion of ibn kathir both of them the student of ibn taymiyyah ibn qayyim Ibn Qayyim says, there are a group of scholars who use that hadith as proof the Torah has not been corrupt. So you're stuck with it. You, Shabir and Bassam, you're stuck with it. It's a nightmare for you guys. I understand. But come on over to the truth and reject Islam and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But let's go beyond that. You just told everyone that it's referring to the original Torah given to Moses. No, the hadith is talking about the copy of the Torah in the hands of the Jews. He said, bring me your Torah. But thank you because you just implicitly admit that has to be the Torah of Moses because if he's confirming it, that means they have accurate copies of the Torah given to Moses. So you just made my point. But finally, and here's my challenge to you, Tisham, open up your Quran, show me a sentence in your Quran where it says the Torah was given to Moses. Let me repeat my challenge. I'm not asking you to show me where the Quran says a book was given to Moses. Kitab. I know the Quran says a Kitab was given to Moses. You said Torah was given to Moses. Quote the verse and show me the Arabic where it says, and the Torah we sent down to Moses. Show me that. And if you can't show me that, where did you get that information from? So that's my challenge. Please, please answer my question. Uh, you said where the, uh, repeat it, I'm sorry. Okay, I want you to quote because I'm making my question precise so that we don't attack straw man and bring out red herrings. And I know you won't do that because you're a respectful, respectful chap. I want you to show me, because you said to everyone that it's re affirming the original Torah given to Moses. Quote a verse in the Quran where it says, the Torah was given to Moses. I'm not asking you to show me where it says, a kitab, a book was given to Moses. 
I want the exact reference where it says, and the Torah we sent down to Moses, or we gave to Moses the Torah, like it says, and to Jesus we gave the gospel. In chapter 5, verse 46, it says, and to Jesus, son of Mary, we gave the gospel. Show me where it says, and we gave the Torah to Moses. Give me that, because that's what you claim. It confirms the original Torah given to Moses. Show it to me. Where'd you get that from? It's not in your Quran. So please give me the verse. I'll be waiting. Uh, Quran, chapter 3, verse 3. Hang on. It doesn't say Torah given to Moses. I know the Arabic. It says it confirms the Torah and the gospel. So again, maybe I wasn't clear. I'm trying to help you avoid answering the question indirectly. Let me repeat it again. Chapter 3, verse 3 to 4 does not say the Torah is given to Moses. It says the Torah and the gospel were given as guidance and light to mankind. I'm going to repeat the question one more time. Show me in the Quran where it says the Torah was given to Moses, like in chapter 5, verse 46, it says the gospel was given to Jesus. See, the Quran is clear. The gospel we gave to Jesus. Show me where it says the Torah we gave to Moses. Don't quote me a verse where it says Torah. I know it's there. Torah given to Moses. Give me the verse. All right, Sam, Quran, Sam, Sam, Sam go, ahead, go ahead and give Itisham a, a couple minutes to, uh, sure, to, uh, to answer. Go ahead. And let me know when you want me to answer, Dave. Quran chapter two verse fifty three says, "Remember, we gave Moses." The you're sounding uh, you're sounding you're sounding what weird uh, right now. So just just chat with me for a second. We'll see if that goes away. Uh, yeah, you sound you sound like a robot right now. Right now. Nope, sounds. Uh, we we hear you. You just sound uh, like a like a robot voice. Well, j j just just go ahead and talk. Get a little get a little closer to your phone. We'll see if it goes away. All right. Uh, Quran chapter two verse fifty three says, "We gave Moses the scripture." Can you hear me? Uh, no, the sound is bad. Um. Can you hear me now? You still sound like a robot. Um, trying to think if there's a way. To uh, to fix that real quick, uh, maybe maybe a uh, man. I don't want to completely hang up because uh, I'm not great with Skype. Check check. Go ahead and check. Okay. Yeah, you sound like you have a robot voice and it's quiet. Hmm. Does it, can he call back in or something or no? Um. Yeah, Etishem, why don't you try why don't you try hanging up and calling right back and we'll see if that we'll see if that fixes it. That that it usually does. If there's a if there's a uh, Yeah, just just end just yeah. end call and then try calling right back. Okay. All right, did he try is he trying that? Yeah. Yeah, chapter 2 verse 53. Again, he's not. That says we gave the book to Moses Kitab and I said that. That says a book was given. One sec. One sec, Sam. Ah, what happened? Um, at the sham, you there? Yeah. Up. Oh, the sound is still bad. Um. Here, let me hang up. I'm going to try calling both of you back at the same time. Then we'll see what happens. All right. Um, all right. One second. Can you hear me? I hear you. Yeah, you could. You should see me now. Okay, I'm all right. So good. Yeah, we see. We see you. I'm trying to get Etisham in there. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Technical difficulties. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. yeah, that's all right. Well, we'll do what we can. Yeah, problem problem is I'm 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 not good with Skype. When, I'm not good with Skype when something goes wrong. Yeah, none of us are. Well, everything well, works. No, out. some people are awesome and they know exactly what they're doing and they would be saying, uh, "Here's how you do it." Uh, yeah, me and you, me and you suck. That's what I'm saying. None of us are you and me. Uh, yeah, and then when Etisham calls back, then when Etisham calls back, then when I you call him, when I answer, it just here he goes. I see him coming back on. Do you see him? Yeah. Says Etisham. All right. Hey, Etisham, you there? Yeah. 
Okay, now Please. your sound is better. Oh, you sound better now. Oh, okay. Okay, go go ahead. Yeah, go ahead and res go ahead and respond to Sam. Uh, okay, yeah. So the Quran, um, the Quran chapter two verse seventy. Uh, the Quran chapter two verse fifty three says we gave Moses the scripture. So, you know, I mean, uh, so what? Like, and then the Quran chapter forty six verse twelve. Uh, yeah. So you know. So, but regardless, uh, you know, we Muslims don't believe that the Old Testament was revealed to Moses. Uh, you know, like the like the book of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. We don't believe that, anyways. So, I, I don't, I don't know what your argument is. What's your, what's your argument? Okay, <clears throat> notice what you said right now. You just said we don't believe the Old Testament was given to Moses. You believe the Torah was given to Moses, and you just quoted two verses that says a book was given to Moses. How do you know that? Even though the book of Isaiah is attributed to Isaiah, for argument's sake, because remember what you said. I want you to hold you consistent. The Old Testament, New Testament, they're corrupt. So how do you know that the book of Isaiah wasn't falsely attributed to Isaiah, but it was actually written by Moses? Because the Quran doesn't tell you what was given to Moses. How do you know the Torah is given to Moses? Where'd you get that information? See, if you don't know an answer, I'll show you why I'm asking you the question. Because you said, I want everyone to hear it. We believe the original Torah given to Moses. No, you don't, because the Quran doesn't tell you any original Torah was given to Moses. How do you know it was given to Moses? How do you know what book was given to whom? The Torah, does, it's not told. You're not told the Torah was given to Moses. The only thing you're told in the Quran is that the gospel is given to Jesus and that David wrote Psalms. Let me give you the verses there. Chapter 4, verse 163 of the Quran and chapter 17, verse 55 says that to David we gave the Psalms and to Jesus we gave the gospel. So how do you know who the Torah was given to. It says a book was given to Moses. But well, what's that book? How do you know what book was given to Moses? So this is what I'm asking. Because when you answer, you're going to show that you're dependent on my Bible to fill out the gaps in your Quran, the very Bible that in one breath you want to use to prove Muhammad, but then condemn it because it exposes Muhammad. So how do you know what was given to Moses? How do I know what was given to Moses? Well, we got to do some reasoning here we got to know what the quran's talking about and uh things like that so allah is clearly saying he gave the the torah or the revelation to moses but that revelation is not the old testament so uh you know according to the seers according to hadith and uh, things like that again keep in mind that we have to keep everything in its proper context we have to keep everything within its proper uh, understanding what the Muslim scholars have understood, and the Muslim scholars have always understood that the Jews and Christians have corrupted their scriptures. Uh, you know, so I mean, uh, if you read Tafsir ibn Kathir, uh, you know, Ibn Abbas, all these, you know, early Muslim scholars don't agree with your view. So, like, uh, so like, what's your argument here? Okay, like, let know. me let me respond. Okay. Hang on, hang on. Let, let me just make yeah. let me just make sure uh, it the sham was was finished. Yeah, he said, what's your, yeah, he's asking me to respond. That's yeah, yeah. okay, okay, go ahead, yeah, Sam. Okay, okay. It, it, Sham, this is now the third time I just said, Ibn Qayyim, who is a contemporary of Ibn Kathir, says there's a group of scholars that said the Torah is incorruptible. Why do you keep saying that this is the view of the Muslim scholars, the early Muslim scholars don't agree with me? They actually do agree with me, they disagree with you. <clears throat> Ibn Ishaq, that you tried to throw under the bus and went to Ibn Hisham, he believed the Bible is not corrupt. Tabari believed the Bible wasn't corrupt. <clears throat> Ibn Qayyim mentioned scholars that said that the Torah is incorruptible. I just mentioned them. And you keep telling me all the scholars are on your side. No, they're not. Even Bukhari said the Bible is not corrupt. And I have the citations in front of me. And you know who told me that Bukhari said that the scriptures are incorruptible? Ibn Qayyim. He quotes Bukhari. He even says, Ar-Razi. Ar-Razi says that the Torah is incorruptible. So where are you getting that all the scholars, all the commentators agree with you? No, they don't. There were scholars that agreed the Bible's not corrupt, but then as they saw the problem, the Bible as it existed at that time exposes Muhammad as a fraud, then they had to then adopt the approach, well, that means the scriptures were corrupted. No, it means Muhammad is a fraud. Doesn't mean the scriptures are corrupted, especially when the Quran agrees that the scriptures are incorruptible, preserved, and the scriptures of the Jews and Christians were the pure words of God that Muhammad appealed to to verify his claim. So stop saying that the commentators are on your side. They're not. In fact, here I'm going to prove it to you. If you have Ibn Kathir, I want you to read for me what Ibn Kathir says about Jesus confirming the Torah between his hands. And here are the references. Please write these down. And if you have the English translation, you don't need to know the Arabic. In chapter 3, verse 50 of the Quran, 48 and 50, what does Ibn Kathir say about Jesus 
confirming the Torah. Chapter 3, verses 48 and 50. And then what does he say about Jesus confirming the Torah in chapter 5, verse 46? And then what does he say about Jesus confirming the Torah in chapter 61, verse 6? There, Ibn Kathir, in those three passages, actually there are four, but I count th chapter 3, verse 48 and 50 as one. He says that Jesus confirmed, upheld, lived up to the Torah in his possession. Because in the Arabic, if you read it, it says Jesus confirmed the Torah between his hands. It's musaddiqan lima bayna yadehi. Sadaqa, the verb to mean confirm and bear witness to the truth thereof. Between his hands, bayna yadehi. So that's an Arabic idiomatic expression meaning the Torah that he had access to and read. So Ibn Kathir, the one you're quoting, tells me, the historical Jesus confirmed the Torah in his possession and didn't say a single word about its being corrupt. Now, Ittisham, I'm going to challenge you. Give me a single manuscript or any textual proof that the Torah that Jesus confirmed, it is so vastly different from the Torah we read and the Torah the Jews had that Muhammad confirmed. Show me that it's completely different. It isn't virtually the same that I have today. And please, Ittisham, do me a favor. Don't appeal to variant readings because you know the crisis in Islam now with all the qirat, all the variant readings and all the corruption to the chronic manuscripts. So please don't go there with the variant readings. Save, save, save us the time from having to go into the corruption of the Quran because it's not going to go well. Let's stick with this. Is there any manuscript proof that Jesus confirmed an Old Testament other than what I read today? What's the proof? Notice how when Ibn Abbas says Jesus was taught the Torah in, in the womb. In, the, in his womb, he wasn't. He wasn't confirming a physical copy, according to Ibn Abbas's uh, view. So, uh, so like, regardless, you know, we follow the Prophet Muhammad. I mean, the, and like, we follow like what the Salaf, the first three generations, say, and all of them agree with my view that the uh, Torah and the Gospel is corrupt. So, I mean, it, even the Prophet Muhammad himself. I just said that Hadith that. The Prophet Muhammad said that the Jews and Christians have corrupted the scriptures, and the Quran says follow the Prophet Muhammad. So, uh, so why are you going to, okay. you know, why are you going to Jesus when we follow the Prophet Muhammad? Uh, uh, maybe I wasn't clear, Tisham. Um, let me try it again. I'm sorry okay. because I speak fast. But he just, he's asking. I'm okay. sorry, dude. Okay. I'm not coming up because he's asking. Okay, That's I get why it. I'm I get okay, um, um, maybe I wasn't clear. Nothing in what you cited from Ibn Abbas says that Jesus confirmed a Torah that God taught him directly in the womb and not the physical copy. Let me repeat it again. Chapter 3, verses 48 and 50. He says to the Jews, chapter 3, verses 48 and 50, specifically verse 50, and he says, supposedly Jesus saying, because you believe in Jesus, uh, says, speaks in the Quran. That's, you believe that. You believe that's Jesus speaking in the Quran. I don't, but since you believe it. In chapter 3, verse 50, and 61, verse 6, Jesus speaking to the Jews, he says, I confirm the Torah between my hands. So you're actually seriously wanting us to believe, you're actually seriously wanting us to believe that Jesus was saying, hey, I'm confirming some Torah that I memorize in the womb, but not the Torah that you have. You're making mincemeat out of the Quran because the Quran says, the Quran says, again, Jesus confirmed the Torah and said to the Jews, O children of Israel, I'm a messenger sent by your Lord to confirm the Torah between my hands. To the Jews hearing Jesus, they're going to say, Oh, you mean the Torah that we have, right? You're confirming that? Can you show me where in the Quran Jesus says, No, 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 no. I'm not confirming your Torah. I'm confirming the one memori uh, taught to me while I was in the womb, but not what you have. You're, you're reading too much into Ibn Abbas, and you're reading out of the Quran, what the Quran plainly teaches. He was confirming whatever Torah they had that the Jews were reading. And then moreover, nowhere did Muhammad say that the scriptures are corrupt. You still didn't give me a verse. You misinterpreted what Muhammad said. And then you said that the first three generations agreed with you. No, they didn't. Wahab bin Munabbeh, he is a follower of the, of the Sahaba. Wahab bin Munabbeh, in the very verse you have referred to, please prove me wrong. I've been challenging you. Open up Ibn Kathir. Go to chapter 3, verse 78. There, Ibn Kathir mentions Wahab bin Munabbeh, and he says, the Torah and the Gospel remain the same because Allah's books are uncorruptible. Why would you dare say in front of everyone that the first three generations agreed with you, Wahab bin Munabbeh is a tabi. He's a follower of the Sahaba, the follower of Muhammad's companions, and he says, Ittisham, either you're lying or you're, you don't know what you're talking about. 
benefit of doubt, you don't know what you're talking about. He says, Torah and the gospel remain as they are because Allah's books are incorruptible. They misinterpret them. So now I'm still waiting to prove. Show me where Muhammad said, you Jews and Christians, your scriptures, the texts have been corrupted. Not that you've corrupted them with your tongue, because that's what 378 says. I'm still waiting for the proof. Give me your proof. The reason why the Quran stays, talks about the Torah and the Gospel is because there are prophecies of Prophet Muhammad in the Torah and the Gospel. It doesn't mean the whole Torah and the Gospel is uh, preserved or whatever. It's, they're just talking about prophecies of Prophet Muhammad. So the real, argument, the real argument the Quran is saying is follow the Prophet Muhammad because according to Islam, the Torah and the Injil prophesies Prophet Muhammad. He's, the Quran is not confirming all of the Torah and the Gospel. It's saying the prophecies found in the Torah and the Gospel, in the original uh, Injil and the Torah, talk about the, prophet, the coming of Muhammad. So Jews and Christians have to follow Prophet Muhammad according to Quran chapter uh, 5 verse 48 and uh, things like that. But uh, again, like, wh what's your argument? You would have to prove that the Bible is reliable, uh, you know, other than just pointing the finger at our scripture saying, yeah, the Quran confirms the Bible. You have to prove the Bible is uh, correct and authoritative and are uh, true uh, to begin with. So if you're just saying the, the Quran confirms the Bible, uh, you know, you need to prove that the Bible is, you know, the, the Word of God to begin with. So what's your argument? I, I don't get your argument. Well, well, I don't get this argument. Uh, what, one, yeah. one second, just to clarify, because uh, uh, there are, for, for Sam to defend Christianity, it seems like he would have to show that the Bible is reliable, but... Um, I was assuming that you guys were talking about your argument. Your argument was yes, that yeah. the Muhammad uh, said that the Bible's been corrupted, and now we know that the Bible's been corrupted, and so it's uh, something yeah. Muhammad said that was true. And then so then it turned into a discussion of whether the Quran says that actually says that the Bible has been corrupted, or if it affirms its reliability. And yeah, it, it looks like, yes, if, if the Quran were saying that the Bible has been corrupted, then in order to refute that claim, it seems like you would have to show that the Bible hasn't been corrupted. But if, if the Quran actually doesn't say that, and the Quran actually says that the Bible is the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, then... It doesn't matter whether the Bible's corrupt or not. If the Bible's reliable, then Islam's got a problem because the Bible says things that go against Islam. And if the Bible uh, isn't reliable, then it's still a problem for Islam because the, the, the Quran would then be affirming a Bible that's unreliable. So I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not putting my foot down on, yeah. on any position there because I'm focusing on just, just, just moderating. But... Uh, but yeah, and so, can I add? No, I know, no, 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 no. I, I just want, I just that that was to point out to give Ed Tisham a a, a uh, an opportunity to clarify what what does Sam need to show that the Bible is reliable um, in order to do uh, as far as your argument because this this was this was about you giving your case for Muhammad and you you use this yeah. as a point for uh, for yeah. the reliability of Muhammad. Yeah. Did I you mean, want me to answer can, your can, question? Okay. No, no, let him. We, we can. I mean, we, yeah, we. I mean, we can go into other issues, or we can stick with this. Sure. It doesn't really matter. But all I'm saying is that if you read Tafsir ibn Kathir, if you read Tafsir ibn Baz, read Tafsir al Qabri, and things like that, it's talking about prophecies of prophets. So the real argument is that the Quran is saying that there are prophecies of Prophet Muhammad, and that the Jews and Christians have to follow the Prophet Muhammad because their scripture is pointing to the Prophet Muhammad. Now, whether that true, that claim is true or not, that's a separate debate or discussion or, or whatever. But the Quran's really saying the Bible is pointing to Muhammad. The Torah and the Injil is pointing to Muhammad. So the real argument the Quran is saying is that follow the Prophet Muhammad because according to your own scriptures, according to the Quran, chapter 10, verse 94, the verse you just cited, it says if you read the commentaries of Syrian theater to Syrian and Boston, so it's saying there are prophecies of Prophet Muhammad. In the Quran chapter ten, verse ninety-four, it's saying ask the people. It's not saying believe them, it's saying ask them. Because there are okay. prophecies of Prophet Muhammad, according to Al Tabari and things like that. But again, this is this isn't a good argument. Uh, you know, I, I don't understand why this argument is being put, but we can talk about other things. But the reason why I appeal to the Bible is because I'm talking to a Judeo Christian audience. I'm guessing most of the people are Christian. So that's why I'm using the Bible to show, according to the Bible, Christians can't reject the Prophet Muhammad because the Prophet Muhammad fulfilled 
um, all the criteria. Now, if you want to talk about crucifixion, resurrection, deity of Christ, we can do that uh, too. Okay. You know, that's not a problem. Yeah. Before you do that, we're sticking on Muhammad. Yeah. Now you made an assertion. Let me address that now. You, you, you notice what you said before David said something. I, I'm glad this is recorded. You first said that the Quran is not confirming the Torah and the gospel in totality, only the prophecies. And it's referring to the original Torah, the original gospel that had prophecies of Muhammad. So you want to have your cake and eat it too. If you're saying that what the Quran is confirming are the prophecies of, of Muhammad in the Torah and the gospel, then it's referring to Muhammad's contemporaries. That means those prophecies are there. But then you said, and it's recorded, Atisham, why don't you go back and listen to yourself. Then you said, the original Torah and the gospel had those prophecies. But hold on, if I follow your logic, if the original Torah and the gospel had those prophecies of Muhammad, and Muhammad is appealing to the Jews and Christians, saying there are prophecies in the Torah and the gospel, you just indirectly confirm the original Torah and the gospel were there in their possession in uncorrupt form because remember your argument. Let me repeat it again slowly. The original Torah and the gospel had prophecies of Muhammad. So when Muhammad is pointing to the Torah and the gospel of his day in the hands of the Jews and Christians, he's referring to those prophecies in them. How could those prophecies be in them if the original Torah and the gospel were not still extant preserved in their possession. So you actually ended up making my point. But the second point I'm going to say, nowhere does the Quran say that Muhammad only confirms parts of the Torah and the gospel. You went to chapter 10, verse 94. I didn't just go to chapter 10, verse 94. I went to chapter 2, verses 40 to 44, and so on and so forth. And the argument that Muhammad is repeatedly making is, you know I'm a prophet because the book I'm sent with confirm what you have. What you have is the very revelation of God. I agree it's the word of God. My book, my theology, me, we all agree with it except me. And so then the Jews are saying, but hold on. You're saying God is not our father spiritually. You're saying we're not the children of God. You're also ordering things that contradict the Torah. So if you are right that our scriptures are the very pure, uncorrupt words of God, and you confirm them, but then you contradict them, that means all the more proof you don't know what you're talking about, you're a false prophet. So that's not Muhammad's argument. That's your argument. You're reading into Muhammad what Muhammad did not say. But then thirdly, you just said you're appealing to a Judeo-Christian audience, which is why you're going to the Bible. That's exactly why I'm appealing to the Quran, because you're a Muslim. You're bound to the Quran. You're shackled to the Quran. So that means whatever the Quran says about the Bible, you have to accept. Because if you reject it, then you're going to be the Islamic version of Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman argued himself out, out of the Christian faith because of the variant readings of the New Testament. So now you become the Islamic Bart Ehrman. You know what? The Quran is full of variant readings. It's corrupt. It's not perfectly preserved. And it confirms the Bible and yet contradicts the Bible. I'm done with Muhammad. Then I won't appeal to the Quran anymore. Then I will treat you like a secular agnostic or atheist and use the very criteria that a secular agnostic or atheist would use to determine whether something is historically true and verifiable but you're not you're a muslim so you're stuck with muhammad's testimony and you kept saying ibn kathir let me make this the final point and we can talk about the other claims that you brought up muhammad's prophecies as proof of his prophethood anything but here's what ibn kathir says this is his commentary his exposition of chapter 3 verse 78 his commentary, his exposition of chapter 3, verse 78, which you referred to. Remember in your opening statement? Chapter 3, verse 78, with chapter 3, verse 187, confirmed the Bible's corrupt. Let me read what he says. Okay. Mujahid. And by the way, for the record, I'm not denying. Just I don't want people to misrepresent me. I'm not denying that Ibn Kathir claims the Bible's corrupt. But he comes 700 years later. When he's narrating the views of the Salaf, the commanders of Muhammad and their followers, they have something different to say. Here it is. Ibn Kathir writes, Mujahid, Ashabi, Al Hassan, Katada or Katata, and Rabbi bin Anas said that, who distort the book with their tongues, they don't corrupt the text, means they alter Allah's words. Al Bukhari reported, Al Bukhari, who's long before Ibn Kathir, over 200 years after the death of your Prophet, reported that Ibn Abbas said that the ayah means they alter and add. Although none, pay attention to this, Itisham, none among Allah's creation can remove the words of Allah from his books, not just the Quran, books. They often distort their apparent meanings. And then notice who he cites, Wahab bin Munabbi. Wahab bin Munabbi, who was a tabi, a follower of the Sahaba. He said, the Torah and Jil remain as Allah revealed them. 
and no letter in them was removed. However, the people misguide others by addition and false interpretation, relying on books that they wrote themselves, meaning like the Talmud. Then they said, this is from Allah, but it's not from Allah. As for Allah's books, they are still preserved and cannot be changed. So again, drop this nonsense that Shabir refuted me, Sawadi refuted me, you, none of you refuted me because the facts are on my side. You're just disagreeing with Muhammad, you're refuting Muhammad. And drop this argument that the first three generations thought the Bible was corrupt. No, they're on my side against you. So now let's let's put the icing on the cake. The proof you gave that Muhammad is a prophet backfires against you because the Bible is not corrupt according to Muhammad, but you're saying Muhammad said it is corrupt. So if it is corrupt, but Muhammad said it's not corrupt, that first criterion you gave fails. So let's look at your other criteria to see if Muhammad passes. So far, he hasn't passed. No, no, Sam, you just you, 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 one, se one, one, one second, Etisham. I just want to say, uh, uh, Sam, you talked for a long time, so and we do want to move on to other topics. So I'm going to give Etisham uh, an opportunity to share his final thoughts on that issue, and then I think we should probably go on to his next point, which was Jeremiah eight eight. So, so Etisham, you can go ahead and give your final thoughts on on this issue, and then and then we'll move on. All right. Um, I don't I like. You're making you're 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 making assertions, but you're not actually proving those assertions, right? You're you're actually saying just because the Quran uh, talks about the Torah and then Jill, that doesn't mean all of it is intact. It doesn't mean it's the Old Testament and New Testament. It doesn't mean everything in the Torah in the in Jill is preserved. Uh, because if you read all the commentaries carefully, it's talking about the prophecies. There's prophecies of prophet moment in the Torah. There's prophecies of prophet moment in the Injil. That doesn't mean the whole Torah and Injil are preserved and with us. Uh, that's what you're failing to understand. That's what I think you're failing to understand. And I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to pick on you and uh, things like that. We're trying to keep this civil. Um, you know, in the pro the the issue is even if you're even if you're saying there's scholars saying that the that you know the the Quran affirms the Bible and stuff like that the first the first three generations even if you're saying that uh, I don't believe that's true but even even if that's the case the Prophet Muhammad overthrows all that because the Prophet Muhammad is the final authority right so even if these scholars are saying the there's some parts of the Bible that are true and stuff. The Prophet Muhammad overthrows it because the Prophet Muhammad, the Quran says, follow the Prophet Muhammad. And here's what Ibn Kathir says in his commentary. Now has come to you our messenger, the Prophet Muhammad, explaining to you much of what you used to hide from Scripture and passing over much. So the Prophet Muhammad explained where they altered, distorted, changed, and lied about Allah. He also ignored much of what they changed since it would not bring any benefit, as it was as it was explained. This is Tafsir Ibn Kathir, part 6, page 88. And Ibn Kathir wrote an entire book on how the Bible's corrupt. In uh, Ibn Kathir al Bida al Niya, volume 2, page uh, 152 to 153. And the reason why the Quran talks about the Torah and Injil is because there are prophecies of the Prophet. Well, that's why you're, you're, you're not, I don't think you're understanding that. There are certain prophecies, and those parts are true. Now, whether, whether the Islamic claim is true or not, that's a separate topic. But uh, the, the icing on the cake is Tafsir Ibn Kathir, volume 1, page 178 to 179, where a Jew, a Jewish boy, admits that the Prophet Muhammad is found in their scriptures. So the Prophet, so the the Quran is saying they're prophecies of the Prophet Muhammad, and that's why the the Jews and Christians have to ignore, you know, their their books and follow the Quran according to Islamic theology and according to the Quran, chapter 5, verse uh, 58 and uh, things like that. So the Quran needs to be followed by everybody, uh, including the Jews and Christians, and that Torah and Injil is outdated. It's done. So the real argument is follow the proper moment because the Jews and Christians, because the Jewish and Christian scriptures are pointing to Muhammad according to Islamic claims. So that's my final thought on it. All right. Thank you, Etushem. Now, uh, on the issue of Jeremiah 8.8, eight, um, you argued that, uh, that Jeremiah 8.8 eight affirms the corruption of the Torah. So this would be an Old Testament prophet, um, an Old Testament prophet uh, declaring that the Torah has been altered and corrupted. I just wanted to, I'm, I'm not bringing this up by way of criticism, I'm bringing this up by way of uh, illustration here, but uh, lots of times we would quote Surah 15 verses 90 to 91. Um, so that passage reads, like as we sent down on the dividers, those who made the Quran into shreds. And so here you have a verse of the Quran, um, which says, depending on the translation, Yusuf Ali says, as have made the Quran into shreds as they please. 
um, M. H. Shakir, those who made the Quran into shreds. Uh, Palmer, who said, uh, uh, who translated it as dismember the Quran. Now, when we would point to this passage, the Muslim response would be, well, you need to understand what this is saying in context. You need to look at the historical context, what's the background of this of this passage, and what it means in the context of Scripture. So you look at the literary context, what it means in the chapter as a whole, because this is the same chapter where Allah affirms in Surah 15, verse 9, according to the standard Muslim interpretation, affirms that he's protecting the Quran. So uh, Muslims will point out, you need to look at the context of the chapter, and you need to look at the historical context who these people are who, are who are supposedly shredding the Quran or dividing up the Quran into parts. And the Muslim response would be, once you look at the literary context and the historical context, um, then you see that it's not actually talking about the, the corruption of the Quran. And so it, it seems that th that should be a standard a, a standard approach across uh, a, across all books. So I'm just I just wanted to find out if you would agree that if you if you just read Jeremiah 8:8, 8, 8, it sounds like something along the same lines as you know torn the Quran into shreds. It sounds like it's 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 talking about the corruption of a book. But would you agree that the literary context and the historical background should be an under uh, should be a factor in interpreting the text and seeing what it really says? And uh, yeah, I just wanted that for, for clarification on what the methodology should be when we look at one of these passages. Other than that, give everyone your thoughts again on um, on Jeremiah 8.8, 8, and then we'll see we'll see what uh, Sam thinks about it, and then you can respond to, to Sam's thoughts on that, and then we'll probably move on. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, if you read uh, the, the Quranic verse, well, let me just go into the Quranic verse since you brought that up. Uh, you know, if you read Tafsir Ibn Abbas, Tafsir al-Suti, Tafsir uh, Ibn, uh, Ibn Kathir, it's talking about uh, the Quran is saying that there are people who disbelieve parts of the Quran while they believe in other parts. The Quran is not saying it's been corrupted. Uh, how can it be when uh, when God promised to uh, guard the Quran against corruption? The Quran, chapter 15, verse uh, 9. So, you know, I would just suggest reading Tafsir and Kathir, Tafsir and Abbas to understand what the Quran is uh, talking about there. So going to Jeremiah, chapter 8, uh, verse 8. Again, this is not my interpretation, right? I'm not, I'm... Uh, the thing is, like people like uh, James White and people like uh, other Christians who have crossed over to my channel over the years, over the last 10 years, I've always said, you keep appealing to liberal scholarship, you keep appealing to Bart Ehrman, you keep appealing to Richard Carrier, yada, yada, yada. I even cited Richard Carrier in my debate with you, uh, David, like uh, years ago, 10 years ago, 11 years ago or whatever. And then he said, well, that's just a liberal and stuff like that when we... Uh, when we talked about the issues, when we went out to dinner that one time, I don't, I don't think you remember that or whatever. So you keep saying Christians always say, "Well, you're inconsistent using liberal scholarship, atheistic scholarship." So I've dropped that. I revised my position, um, you know, and I've read the Bible sincerely, right? I've read the commentaries, or, or what the biblical scholars say, and I, this is my interpretation. This is in the Bible in Living English, uh, page, page nine, where he talks about, uh, you know, the. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 8 verse 8 was so corrupt and incorrect during Jeremiah's time. So what do you have to say about the Judeo-Christian? My question to you two is what do you have to say about the Judeo-Christian scholars who are saying these things? Uh, uh, it, that, 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 yeah. Oh, here, here, I, 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 here again, I keep forgetting that that uh, there there may be viewers who don't even know what we're talking about with Jeremiah 8.8, 8, and they may have come in late and don't even know what the discussion is. So I just want to read the verse so people understand where why that why you would bring why you would bring this up so this is uh, from the book of jeremiah oh. chapter 8 verse 8 ladies and gentlemen how can you say we are wise and the law of the lord is with us but behold the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie so the people are saying the law of the lord is with us and it says but behold the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie so go ahead and go ahead and give us your understanding of that and then and we'll let, let we'll let sam respond my understanding is that the Bible or the Torah was so corrupt during Jeremiah's time that they just weren't they just weren't getting it right. Mm -hmm. They just they were corrupting they were adding false falsities into it and things like that. So even Judeo Christian commentators um, agree with this, you know. So I mean I read the Bible, right? I mean I'm willing to leave Islam and become a Christian if someone can prove that the Bible is historically accurate, there's no falsity, there's no falsities in there, there's no corruption in there, Jesus was really re was resurrected, I'm willing to leave Islam and say Prophet Muhammad is a false prophet if any Christian can prove 
that the Bible is authoritative, Jesus was resurrected, but that hasn't happened, right? I've been challenging Christians for years, and you know, no, no one's no one's come up with some. So, but these are these aren't my interpretations. These are uh, Judeo-Christian scholars saying these things. Uh, you know, so I'm not. This isn't my you know subjective reasoning. This is their reasoning too. So uh, that's just my uh, my two cents on there. And Adam Clark too, who's a Protestant uh, commentator on the Quran and things like that. So these are their their uh, their thoughts, which um, uh, you know. All right. So uh, Sam, you do do you yes. agree? Do you agree that Jeremiah eight eight is referring to the textual right. corruption of the Torah? And if so, yeah. how does that affect um, how does that affect our confidence that we might have yes. in, in the Torah? Okay. Now he said Adam Clark again. I will challenge him. Don't quote Adam Clark out of context. He's expo expositing Jeremiah 8.8, 8, and yes, he's going to tell you that there were a specific group of people that tampered with the Torah. But that's the same Adam Clark that gave a commentary on the entire Bible, and he was a devout Christian who believed in inspiration, preservation of the Bible, and he knows what others after Jeremiah said about the Torah. So please, again, out of respect, don't selectively cite scholars and take snippets out of their commentaries, ignore the context and then come to conclusions other than the conclusions they made. How do I know that Jeremiah 8.8 8 doesn't teach that the Torah was corrupted beyond <clears throat> repair or corrupted to the extent that the original Torah no longer existed? Jeremiah tells me that's not what he meant. Daniel, his contemporary, tells me that's not what he meant. Ezra, who came after Jeremiah and Daniel, tells me that's not what Jeremiah 8.8 8 means. Jesus tells me that's not what Jeremiah 8.8 8 means. And your own prophet, whom you believe, says that can't be the meaning. Because if that's the meaning, you again prove that Muhammad is a false prophet. So let me take it step by step. Now, if you have done your homework and you're really honestly seeking to understand my scriptures, as I've tried to do with your Quran, then you know that Daniel was a contemporary of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was prophesying in Jerusalem. And Daniel was in Iraq, in Babylon, in the court's palace, prophesying roughly the same time. Daniel, you knew Jeremiah. Do you think that Jeremiah was saying the Torah was corrupted so we don't have it anymore? What do you say, Daniel? Here, Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 to 3. For the sake of time, I'll just read the two, two verses. Daniel 9, verses 1 to 3, but verses 1 and 2. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord, given to Jeremiah the prophet, so at Tisham, pay attention. Daniel is reading the scroll of Jeremiah because this is long after Jeremiah. He's probably dead by now. This is when Babylon is destroyed and the Persians have come to power. And he's got a copy of Jeremiah's prophecy that was sent to him in Babylon. And he goes, I understood from the scripture that Jeremiah wrote, according to the word of the Lord given to him, that the captivity of the Jews would last 70 years. So now, remember, he has Jeremiah. That means he's reading Jeremiah 8.8. 8. Now let's see if Daniel concludes the way you do. We don't have the law of Moses. Daniel 9, 11. All Israel has transgressed your law. This is Daniel now praying to God, asking, okay, God, 70 years is about over. What's next for us? All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses. Daniel, how do you know what's written in the law of Moses? According to my friend Etisham and this liberal scholar that he cites, claiming to be a conservative, and I'm not talking about Adam Clark. The Torah was destroyed beyond repair. It was gone, Daniel. How do you know what's written in the Law of Moses? And how do you have a copy of the Law of Moses? So you see it, Tisham? Even if I argue that Jeremiah 8.8 8 is referring to some scribes at a specific location corrupting their copies, there are uncorrupt copies of the Torah in the hands of God-fearing men and women that they cherished and read as is and didn't tamper with, one of whom is Daniel. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. Verse 13, Daniel 9, verse 13. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, you can't know what's written in the law of Moses, Daniel. What are you talking about? Didn't you read from Jeremiah 8, 8? Torah is corrupt. What are you talking about? Let me read it again. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord, Jehovah our God, by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. And if that's not good enough, Ezra, Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 to 19. It's a long one, so I'm going to just read the salient parts. 
Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 to 18. Let's read. All the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses. Oh, David, you know what? We need to go back in time, David, because we need to remind, remind Ezra, Ezra, you don't have the book of the law of Moses. What are you talking about? Jeremiah 8, 8, before you said it's corrupted. David, man, can we maybe create a time machine and go back in time and correct Ezra, poor guy? Let me read it. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord commanded over Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women, and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from a Torah that didn't exist. He read aloud from his imagination. Maybe he too was taught the Torah in his mother's womb. Who knows? But it wasn't a physical book. He read aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate, in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Again, for the sake of time, let me skip to verse 5. Ezra opened the book, a book that didn't exist. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their heads and responded, Amen, Amen. They bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Now, again... I think you get the point because it's a long chapter. Ezra has a copy of the book of the law, an uncorrupt copy of the book of the law, long after Jeremiah as he returns to Jerusalem. And the people know this is the book of the law. They hear the words and out of worship of God, they fall down and praise God who had given the book of the law of Moses that was preserved in the possession of Ezra. Now, if that's not good enough, if that's not good enough, Jesus in the New Testament and the Quran, which I mentioned but which was ignored. Matthew 5, verses 17 to 18. Luke 24, verses 44 to 47. Jesus says, Think not I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but fulfill. For truly I say to you, not one jot or tittle shall pass away. Right? Heaven and earth shall pass away, but not one jot or tittle pass away until all things are fulfilled. So Jesus is saying, I'm coming to fulfill the law and the prophets. And Luke 24, 44, 47, he says, this was, was what was written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And he opened their mind to understand the things written about him in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. What? Hold on, Jesus. Don't you know Jeremiah 8, 8 says the Torah is corrupted beyond <clears throat> restoration. You don't have the Torah. So what are you confirming? What are you reading? But wait, the Quran says, Jesus, you came to confirm the Torah that according to, to Sham's reading of Jeremiah 8, 8 did not exist. Okay, well, maybe Jesus' statement is not good enough. You kept saying that the Quran says, follow Muhammad's example. Well, let me tell you what Muhammad said to do. Chapter 5 at Tisham, open it and read it. Chapter 5, verses 40, 43 to 47, he says, Why do the Jews come to you, Muhammad? Seeing they have the Torah, they're in his guidance and light. Oh my goodness. Muhammad, what are you saying? According to Ibn Kathir and Tisham, you're supposed to tell the Jews, forget your Torah, it's corrupt, follow me. But Muhammad doesn't sound like you. Muhammad says, why you Jews are coming to me? Go to your Torah, stick with it, because therein is guidance and light. Follow the Torah, because the prophets followed the Torah. And then in case you missed it, chapter 5, verse 46 says, and in their footsteps we sent Jesus, the son of Mary, confirming the Torah between his hands, and we gave him the gospel containing guidance and light, confirming the Torah between his hands. Let the people of the gospel judge by what God has revealed in it. Oh my goodness, Muhammad. It to Shaman, Ibn Kathir says, that the Torah and the Gospel are corrupt and obsolete, we need to follow you. But when I come to follow you, then you tell me, follow your Gospel, judge according to your Gospel, follow it. Wow. So if I follow Muhammad, I have to follow my Bible. But if I follow my Bible, I have to condemn Muhammad as a fraud because he contradicts the Bible. Wow. So neither Jeremiah, nor Daniel, nor Ezra, nor Jesus, nor your prophet stated that Jeremiah 8.8 8 means the Torah was corrupted, it no longer existed, and the final icing on the cake. Jeremiah 36 at Tisham, and you're going to have to adjust all these points, and I hope you adjust them point by point. Jeremiah 36, God tells Jeremiah, take a scroll and write down the words I'm giving you. So then Jeremiah tells his scribe, Berechiah, Bar write these words down, send it to the king. The king with a knife cut it piece by piece and threw it in the fire. He destroyed that copy. The true God of Jeremiah said, take another scroll, write down all the words that were in the first one and add these words. You see what my God can do at Tisham? My God can restore a book that's been corrupted 
because he's almighty to do so. Like he restored Jeremiah's prophecy that was destroyed by the king. If the Torah had been corrupted, because there were still prophets receiving revelation, all God needed to do is have Jeremiah write down all the words of the law of Moses and preserve it intact. So at best, you're clutching at straws. Jeremiah 8, 8 does not teach what you're saying any more than chapter 15, verses 9 and 91 of the Quran teaches the Quran is corrupted. Notice how you explain that away. No, it doesn't mean that. 15, 90, 91 doesn't mean people chopped up the Quran, desecrated the Quran, because Allah promised to preserve it. Oh, but Jeremiah 8, 8 has to mean the Torah is corrupt, because you realize if it's not corrupt, the gig is up, Muhammad is a false prophet. But you try, Atisha. Hopefully now you respond to my refutation. Remember, these are the same arguments against Shabir Ali, Bassam Zawadi, that you said refuted me. Now respond to me, quote them to see if they refuted me. Let's see how well you'll do. Go ahead. Well, first of all, you quote the Quran, uh, chapter uh, 46 and 47, but uh, you, didn't, you didn't read the Quran, chapter 5, verse 48. It says, it refers to the Quran as Muhayyim, which is the overworker or quality controller of the previous scriptures. So why are you not quoting the Quran, chapter 5, verse uh, uh, verse 48, right? Like, uh, why are you, uh, and the Quran says it's revealed, the gospel was revealed to Jesus, that the Torah was revealed to uh, Moses. That doesn't necessarily mean that it was written down about Moses. It was written down about Jesus, you see? So that's what you're uh, failing to um, understand. As for, you know, Jesus confirming the Torah uh, and the other prophets confirming the Torah in the Old Testament and New Testament, well, you would have to prove that Jesus actually said that because there's unknown authorship in the New Testament, according to your conservative scholars, you would have to prove Jesus actually said that, and you would have to prove that the Old Testament is accurate when it's talking about those things. How do you know that? You know, because we have unknown authorship in the New Testament, we have unknown authorship in the Old Testament, and uh, things like that. So you would have to prove that the Bible is actually true when it talks about those things. So just appealing to the Bible isn't going to work. You've got to prove the Bible is reliable before you point the finger uh, back at us. Again, you didn't read the Quran, chapter 5, verse 48, that says the Quran overthrows the Torah. It overthrows the Angel, and the Quran has to be followed by everybody. Again, the Quran, chapter 5, verse 48. So uh, so that's you know that's the correct Islamic interpretation. You're just taking things out of context. I mean, I'm being sincere here. I don't mean to be cruel or mean or whatever. I'm My theory is that you're just taking things and you're making the Quran say what you want it to say. No, that's not how it works. The Quran explains itself. So you have to read the Quran in its proper context, like the Quran chapter 5, verse 48, which says the Quran overthrows the Torah and Injil, and the Quran has to be followed by all of mankind. Do you want me to answer that? Um, yeah. Yeah. Or do you, what do you want me to Because he's asking me about 548, so you want me to answer that or no? Uh, yeah, I think we should... Uh... Itosham, if you had anything else on Jeremiah 8.8, 8, um, if you wanted to address that, because 5.48 is going to push us kind of into a, like, like like that's kind of its own mini topic in itself. So did you have any other, did you have any other thoughts on, uh, well, let, let, let me, let me, let me, let me ask yeah. you, let me ask you this way, because uh, yeah. I, I'm just going to ask it because you're, you're clearly reading that book <laughs> different from the way that I read it every time I've read every time I've read the book of Jeremiah. Here, here's the impression I get: um, there are, are there's Jeremiah and there's a bunch of false prophets, and Jeremiah is preaching that the Babylonians are coming. The Babylonians are gonna are gonna come as instruments of God's judgment on the on the city for their rebellion against God. And the, the showdown you keep seeing is Jeremiah versus these false prophets. Well, Jeremiah walks around and he's got a scribe who writes down what he says. But the false prophets also have scribes and they're writing down what they say. And so when I get to Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 8, and it says he refers to the law and how the lying pens of the scribes have made it a lie. Well, he says the same, he says the same thing about the false prophets. He keeps saying, God told you that God told you that if you rebel against him, he's going to judge you. And the false prophets are telling you that, no, God's always going to protect you. And that's what he's revealed. So Jeremiah says, no, in his word, in his book, in the Torah, God says, if you rebel, I'm going to treat you like the nations that were before you. I'm going to cast you off the land. And the false prophets are saying, the false prophets are saying, no, no, no. God promised that no matter what happens and no matter what you do, he's always going to protect you from being, from being kicked off the land. And so 
Jeremiah says these false prophets are telling you that the book of God is a lie. They're, te they're telling you the book of God is a lie, that, God, that God's a liar, because he said he's going to push you off the land. They're saying no. And then when he talks about their scribes, he says the lying pens of the scribe have made the law a lie. The law, the law says God's going to judge you and, and kick you off the land. The false prophets and their false scribes say, no, 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 that's not going to happen. It'll never happen. And so Jeremiah is rebuking these false prophets and false scribes. So the way I interpret Jeremiah there is Jeremiah saying that when you guys write your prophecies saying that God's never going to punish you, you're making the you're making his law into a lie. You're interpreting it as no, the the law itself has been corrupted. And but here here again when I, when we look at the law, when we look at the Torah, it does contain what Jeremiah says, not what the false prophets say. It doesn't the, the the law doesn't say no matter what happens God's just going to protect you no matter what you're going to be safe and the Babylonians are never going to come. The law we have says what God would do and then that's exactly what happened and it's an exact fulfillment of what Jeremiah said. So when I read when I read Jeremiah 8:8, 8, 8, I read Jeremiah 8:8 8, 8 as their false prophets and their false scribes are making the law of God into a lie by what they're saying. What they're saying is that God's not going to judge the city. But Jeremiah is saying God is going to judge the city. So that's how I'm reading the entire book in context. And I'm only bringing this up because, um, as you pointed out, yes, if, if, you, if, you, if you were just to read Surah 15, verses 90 to 91, you just read that and that's the only thing you read, you might say, wow, that, the Quran's been shredded. Oh, my goodness. Whereas if you read it in context and then you give it a historical background, then you might say, oh, here's, here's what it's actually saying. So, so I, I'm reading Jeremiah completely differently from, uh, from the way you're reading it. So uh, if you wanted to explain um, basically why we should read it in, in the way you're talking about, and then we can, then we can move on to, to chapter 5, yeah. verse 48. But yeah, I'm looking, I'm, look, I'm looking at the, the broader how you interpret the, this book as a whole, because the, the, the verse, if, if you read it like I read it, it makes perfect sense in, in light of the book, whereas it, we, but we do see it over and over again from Muslim apologists saying that Jeremiah 8.8, 8, nope, it just says the Bible's been corrupted, and, and then Sam gave, gave, I think, five reasons on why that can't possibly be the case, given what the rest of the Bible said, but, but go, ahead, go ahead and share your thoughts on that. I just wanted to, I just wanted to get that out because, yeah, I, 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 I focus a lot on methodologies and so on of, of, of interpreting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, but the issue is that when Muslims are citing that verse, they're not just citing that verse. They're citing Judeo-Christian commentaries. They're not citing atheist or liberal scholarship. They're citing. So my question is to both of you would be uh, why the two questions I have is why don't your own Judeo-Christian scholars agree with you? like the Bible in living English, 89, which is a Christian, you know, uh, editor of that bible he doesn't agree with your views he says that the that the torah was so corrupt so incorrect during jeremiah's time that uh jeremiah uh you know that would be hard to that false falsehood was put into it so mm -hmm. your own judeo christian scholars don't agree with your interpretation of yeah. uh of jeremiah chapter 8 verse 8 and and you keep and then if you keep saying well jesus confirmed the torah and the people of the Old Testament confirmed the Torah, you would have to prove that the Bible is reliable when it's talking about those things, yeah. right? It's like, why do you think uh, I don't, uh, I, I'm, I'm not a Christian because the New Testament has to be proven historically accurate in order for me to believe that Jesus said those things, Jesus actually rose from the dead, uh, Jesus yeah. died by crucifixion and stuff like that. So you would have to prove that the Bible is reliable, and you have your own Judeo-Christian scholars saying that, no, there's unreliability in the text and stuff like that. So your own Judeo-Christian scholars don't agree with your interpretations. So that's why, you know, I'm bringing it up. This isn't my interpretation. I'm hoping to follow uh, say this. That's, uh, that's not my thoughts. Okay, so I don't know. Does he want me to respond now? I don't get it. Uh, did you want to respond, or did you want to check out uh, 5.48? I mean, five... No, well, he made some assertions I need to address before he goes on, okay. because he kept saying, okay, I know ahead. there's a temptation to change the topic to about the scriptures and what the scholars actually say. You keep referring to a translation, and Ibtisham, it's like me quoting to you Rashad Khalifa's translation of the Quran, or the Quran, a reformist translation, where they say chapter 9, verses 128, 129, they're corrupt verses, interpolations, and they omitted it from their Quran version. If you go to their Quran version, it's online. Rashad Khalifa's Quran and the Quran, a reformist translation. Chapter 9 ends at verse 127. You would tell me, who cares? These are some fringe group, some fringe Muslims 
doesn't matter what they say, what's the proof? And that's what you're doing here. You're selectively citing those scholars that have liberal assumptions. Just because someone claims to be a Christian doesn't mean he's not a liberal. So instead of selectively citing those scholars you like, give me the historical, textual, archaeological proof for your interpretation of Jeremiah 8, verse 8. There is none. It doesn't support you because if you read Jeremiah chapter 8 in the context of Jeremiah, then read other writings that come after Jeremiah, and then read what Jesus said. And I'm even limited to the Gospels. Because, well, how do we know who wrote the Gospels? Well, your prophet said that the Gospels that the Christians had at that time, they're the uncorrupt revelations of God. You even alluded to it. Chapter 5, verse 46, 47, it says, And to Jesus we gave the Gospel. Let the people of the Gospel judge by what God has revealed in it. In what? The Gospel that was given to Jesus. And then chapter 7, verse 157 of the Quran. 7 verse 157 of the Quran it says that there are prophecy of Muhammad in the Torah and the gospel that's with them so the Quran is saying the gospel of Jesus is with you judge by it and to further prove it you mentioned Ibn Hisham and you even picked up the book the English translation by Alfred Guillaume can you do me a favor take your copy of Alfred Guillaume and go to pages 103 104 I'm gonna tell you what's there I'm gonna tell you what's there and then you can read it because Ibn Hisham left this part intact he didn't omit it Ibn Hisham, pages 103, pages 103 to 104. Just when you get there, you just open it up, pages 103, yeah. 104, and I'm going to have you read it. Let me finish the point before. Just go to pages 103, 104. Alfred Guillaume, it's third time. Pages 103 to 104. Open it up, and I'm going to have you read it in front of everyone. Here, Ibn Hisham did not omit this part. When Ibn Hisham didn't like something in Ishaq, he would get rid of it. But this part he left intact. And Ibn Ishaq there says that there is a prophecy of your prophet written in the gospel that God gave to Jesus for the followers of the gospel, which John wrote down. So he admits that John wrote the gospel of John. And you're saying, well, even your scholars don't know who wrote it. No, you're misquoting my scholars. You misquoted Craig Blomberg. When Craig Blomberg is saying gospels are anonymous, he means they were written anonymously, meaning the authors did not identify themselves. But Craig Blomberg is the last evangelical scholar who denies Matthew wrote Matthew, Luke wrote Luke, Mark wrote Mark, John wrote John. Why? Because although the writers don't identify themselves, and that's what he means by anonymous, they didn't say I, Matthew. He looks at the early historical textual data, which you're referring to, and if you've read him honestly in context, he shows the earliest data, and there were no competing voices state that Matthew wrote Matthew, Luke wrote Luke, Mark wrote Mark, John wrote John. Now I'm tempted to show why the attestation of these authors to the Gospels attributed to them is authentic, but I won't change the subject. The subject is Muhammad. So you're wrong on all counts. You are wrong in all counts because according to even the Quran, let's put the Gospels aside. You don't want to believe the Gospels? The Quran says Jesus confirmed the Torah between his hands. So unless you're trying to tell me that Muhammad is a false prophet because he was wrong. Jesus could not have confirmed a Torah that was corrupted according to Jeremiah 8. If you're a Muslim, you're stuck with Muhammad. And Muhammad says you're stuck with the Torah as it existed at the time of Jesus and Muhammad's time. And that Torah is what I have. You're stuck with my Torah. So if it is corrupt, Muhammad is corrupt. The Quran is corrupt. He's a false prophet. More proof you should stop being a Muslim. Now that's my final comments. We can go into chapter 5 verse 48. But do me a favor, please, in the view of all. You have the book. Open up to pages 103, 104. Read aloud slowly where Ibn Ishaq, as edited by Ibn Hisham, cites the prophecy of your prophet. Read it slowly because I want them to hear what your source says. Who wrote the fourth gospel? Was it some anonymous writer or is it the gospel of John? Please read it slowly out loud. It's right there near the end. You'll see it. Uh, well, the, the problem is this isn't reliable. Ibn Ishaq's not reliable anyways. I just, that, that was my presentation. That no, you didn't hear me. Ishaq, it's not reliable. It's not yeah. it's not me, reliable I don't want to cut you off. So yeah, but you're not I'm listening. Hang on, hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Yeah. Sam, yeah, Sam, Sam. Sam. Ibn Ishaq did say earlier in the debate that he doesn't regard uh, Ibn Ishaq as yeah, but a reliable Dave, source. I already know but that. then you, yeah, yeah you, you, you said you had a point. What? Yeah, but the point was he didn't hear me. I'm reciting Ibn Hisham. If you guys remember, I know what he said. I want both of you to hear, and I say this because, again, you're the moderator. Did you guys hear him say, we don't go with Ibn Ishaq, but we go with Ibn Hisham? You mentioned Ibn Hisham. Ibn Hisham. I got right here. He doesn't, he doesn't have that story. No, what you have there, let me correct you again. We can talk over each other. You can let me make my point. 
What you're reading in pages 103, 104 is found in Ibn Hisham's version. He didn't omit that. It's in Ibn Hisham's version. I know you don't accept Ibn Ishaq. I heard you. You're not hearing me. Alfred Guillaume is based on Ibn Hisham, and then he adds parts from Tabari that Ibn Hisham omitted. If you read, that's Ibn Hisham's version, pages 103, 104. So I know what your argument is. Hear my argument. That's Ibn Hisham quoting Ibn Ishaq and saying this is Sahih because he doesn't omit it. Now, can you read it for us, please? All right. It says, among the things that have reached me about Jesus, slowly. the Son of Mary. What? Slowly, so because if you read too uh, fast, okay. we're not going to catch it. Read it loudly, slowly. Among, all right. I'm just going to read the rebel in part. Among the things that, I'm not going to read the entire thing. Among the things which have reached me about Jesus, the Son of Mary, stated in the gospel, which he received from God for the followers of the gospel, and applying a term described to the apostle of God, is the following. It is extracted that John the Apostle sat down for them when he wrote the gospel for them, the testament of Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, uh, he had, uh, he had me had hated the Lord, um, you know, and then, you know, it talks about uh, the comforter. I I'm just trying to Who save wrote time. the gospel? What? Who wrote the gospel according to Ibn Hisham? Uh, uh, John the Apostle. So why do you keep saying it's anonymous? Why are you going against your own Muslim sources? I don't accept it. I don't accept what Ibn Asak says. He's not. It's not reliable, anyways. So Ibn Asak can say Ibn Asak says Paul is the, Paul is a disciple, but it's not. A, it's not. It's not authentic, anyways. That's Ibn Asak's misinterpretation, or Ibn Asak didn't do any kind of fact checking. He was writing down anything he heard from anybody. That we don't take that from our sources. Uh, you know. So Ibn Asak didn't do the proper methodology. To verify a report or not so it doesn't matter what Ibn Asak says it matters if what he's saying is reliable or not and most of the time it's not reliable according to other Muslim scholars so or uh, you know so that's why I don't accept Ibn Asak so you could quote Ibn Asak left and right but you know you need to prove what he's saying is actually reliable and most of the time there's no uh, sources for his uh, his stories or his sayings. so I mean it's worthless sayings anyways okay now can I just follow up uh, Ibn Asham did not omit that. Did Ibn Asham think it was unreliable? Because he omits things he doesn't think is reliable in Ibn Ishaq. But Ibn Asham included that. So was he wrong? Ibn, I have Ibn Asham's work. He, do, he doesn't say that. Yes, he does. <laughs> that is in Ibn Asham. I don't have the particular version you have. He does quote it. It's from Ibn Hisham. Please, I'm not trying to debate you. Even if you read the introduction by Alfred Guillaume, he says, this is based on Ibn Asham. And the places where Ibn Asham omitted, he reinserted from Tabari. Ibn Hisham is the one who left that intact. Was he wrong to do so? Well, you're not reading the introduction because the court... I did read it. In the introduction, it says that there are scholars who say that Ibn Ishaq reported worthless sayings from people. So even if Ibn Hisham left that, he didn't. Ibn Hisham didn't do any kind of fact-checking here. So, you know, I, I mean, we accept uh, Sayyid Bukhari, you know, stuff like that to be the most authoritative. So if even if Isham left that, that's a mistake on his part. That's not a mistake on, uh, you know, that's not that's not binding on us. He would have to okay. show the Isnad or chain of transmission. Uh, Can, it, it, Dave, is it okay to ask him, Falco, about the prophecy, though, or no? You want to go to 540? It's up to you. That you're the moderator. Yeah, I think it's almost, it's almost, uh, it, it, we've almost, almost been going two hours, so I'd like okay, to get to, to 48 here. But let's go to uh, 548, yeah. Yeah, uh, and if you want all, to go all, back, all, of, all of, basically, all of these topics could kind of be debates in themselves, right? You could do a debate on Jeremiah 8 8. You could do a debate on what the Quran says about the Bible. You could do a uh, debate. This, David, hmm? Here's what I'm saying. Because it's almost two hours, let's end it with 548. And if he wants to come tomorrow, we can do Muhammad's prophecies in science because we don't want to make this three, four hours, right? Yeah, that, that's true. So why don't why don't we address this? And let me just let me just read it. Uh, let me just read it because Itisham says he said uh, this is five forty eight gives the correct Quranic interpretation of of this issue. So uh, the context. And by the way, uh, for purposes of discussion, everyone, very important for everyone to read. Chapter 5, verses 43 to 48, because it talks about the Torah, talks about the gospel, and then talks about the Quran. But uh, in, 40, in 43, that's where it talks about Jews having the Torah. And in 547, this is where Allah says that the uh, people of the gospel need to judge by what Allah has revealed therein. And then in 548, I'll just read Yusuf Ali, and then Itisham, you can go ahead and, and recap what your understanding of this passage is, and then we'll see if Sam has a different uh, different interpretation. But it says, To thee, 
we sent the scripture in truth, confirming the scripture that came before it and guarding it in safety. So judge between them by what Allah has revealed and follow not their vain desires, diverging from the truth that has come to you. To each among you, we have prescribed a law and an open way. If God had so willed, he would have made you a single people, but his plan is to test you in what he has given you. So strive as in a race in all virtues. The goal of you all is to uh, the goal of you all is to Allah. It is He that will show you the truth of the matters in which you dispute. So the relevant portion there is to you we sent the scripture in truth, confirming the scripture that came before it and guarding it in safety. So judge between them by what God has revealed and follow not their vain desire. So Etishem, why did you say that this is? Um, this is a, a the, this is a key verse in understanding the Quran's interpretation of its perspective on the previous scriptures. Uh, well, I mean, uh, if you, well, maybe I maybe I gave a uh, maybe I gave the wrong reference. But even if you read the Quran, clear, hang on, did I give the wrong? Re can you repeat that reference? I'm sorry, Dave. Uh, chapter Chapter five, verses forty eight. No, this this, sh this should be it's. Uh, um, this is oh, okay. this I'm is a common yeah, passage. That's the one, Mohammed. Yeah. That's the one, Mohammed. Yeah. So you know that means the Quran is the golden worker. So basically, if you read stuff series, you see this is why if you read, if you have a liberal reading of the Quran, it's not going to work. Like if I have a liberal reading of the Bible, Christians aren't going to take me seriously. If I take something out of the Gospel of John, spin my own interpretation, and say, yeah, Mohammed's the spirit of truth of the Pharisees, you'd be like, how dare you read the context, read the commentaries? Well, same thing with the. Quran. I expect Christians to do the same thing with uh, my scripture. Uh, you have to read all their Quranic pads because if you read what the Tafsir Ibn Abbas, Tafsir Ibn Kathir, Tafsir al dabari say, it says that the Quran over the Quran is followed by everybody, and the Quran overthrows the Angel, it overthrows the Torah, and things like that. In other Quranic passages, passages like the Quran chapter two verse eighty-five and the Quran chapter five verse sixty-eight, which I forgot to mention. My apologies. It says the Quran needs to be followed by everybody, including the Christians, including the Jews, including the pagans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the Quran is like the uh, the alpha. The Quran is like overthrowing everything and saying, you know, this is this is the Quran that needs to be followed by everybody according to Islamic theology. And if you want to go to paradise, if you want salvation, uh, obey the uh, the Quran and the messenger. Uh, again, the Quran, chapter 2, verse 185, and the Quran, chapter 5, verse 68. I forgot to uh, mention those uh, verses. So that's just my two cents uh, here. Just, just, to, just to clarify, Etishem, you're saying chapter 5, verse 68 of the Quran yeah. says that yeah. Christians need to follow? Let, let... No, 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 it's saying that... No, no, I'm sorry, I misspoke. The Quran needs to be followed by everybody. I'm just... Uh, you know that includes Christians, Jews, pagans, uh, etc. Et no, you're saying so you're saying correct. you're saying that chapter five, verse sixty-eight says that. Yeah, chapter five, verse sixty-eight. Quran chapter two, verse one eighty-five. Let, let me get, let me. Uh, yeah, let me let me just read chapter five, verse sixty-eight because I, I'm not sure what you're pointing to here. But I think I have an idea, but I'm not sure. Um, so chapter five, verse sixty-eight, and then Sam can give us thoughts on uh, five forty-eight. Um, but 568 says, O people of the book, you have no ground to stand upon unless you stand fast by the Torah, the gospel, and all the revelation that has come to you from your Lord. It is the revelation that comes to you from your Lord and increases in most of them their obstinate rebellion and blasphemy. But sorrow thou not over these people without faith. The reason I was asking you about that is because that's a... That's a verse that we often go to, to say that the Quran is affirming hmm. the scriptures. To say, O people of the book, you have no ground to stand upon unless you stand upon the Torah, the gospel, and all the revelation that has come to you from your Lord. So where, where are you getting Quran out of that? Oh, uh, okay. I mean, that's... Uh, uh, well, maybe, okay, let's... Uh, maybe I mis misinterpret... Maybe I uh, mixed up the verses... If you read Tafsir ibn Kathir on Quran chapter 2, verse 41, it says the Quran is trustworthy over the books that preceded it. So whatever uh, whatever's in the in these books conform, conforms to the Quran is true, and whatever disagrees with the Quran is false. And this is Tafsir ibn Kathir on Quran chapter 2, verse 41. So according to the Muslim scholars, maybe I mixed up those verses, my bad. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, again, we have to read the comments. We have to read what the Muslim scholars understood. 
about the garage and uh, things like that. We can't just spin our own interpretations. Um, if I did that with the New Testament, you were going to take me seriously. Well, you got to quote my scripture in its proper uh, context. So, um, so on, you know. on the issue of five uh, five forty eight. Um, yes. Can I chime in or no? Uh, yes, yeah. Sam, give us your thoughts, yeah. and then Etesham yeah. can respond if he disagrees. Yeah, yeah. Uh, interestingly, he said Tabari Qurtubi, uh, and he said Tabari Ibn Abbas on 548. Unfortunately, Etesham, I'm going to have to say, you probably haven't read what they said in context. Here's Tabari's view of chapter 5, verse 40. I want everyone to listen. Tabari Qurtubi Ibn Kathir say, there's more than one interpretation about Muhaymanin Ali. That's the phrase you're referring to, where it says in a garden over it. Here is Tabari, word for word. Does it mean what you said, Tabri claimed it meant? Okay. Regarding Muhammad, Allah says that he brought down the book to you, O Muhammad, believing in the books that came before it and a witness to them, that they are truth from Allah, faithful to them and a protector to them. Nothing about corruption. That the Quran was sent, Muhammad, that bears witness. Your books, truth from Allah, the Quran is faithful to them and protects them. The root of Haymana means to protect and watch over. That is why it is said when a man watches over something and protects it, it has Haymana over it. The present form of the verb is Yuhayman, and the noun is Haymana. Based on what we have mentioned, the people of interpretation, the Mufassirun, have differed in their explanation of this word. So number one, Itisham. The scholars you cite, Qurtubi, Tabari, they admit that the Mufassirun, the commentators, didn't agree they had different interpretations. That's number one. Number two, he says one of the meanings is the Quran bears witness that they are the truth from God. The Quran is faithful to them and protects them. Doesn't say they're corrupted. That's your misreading. And that's Ibn Kathir's misreading. And other Muslims, their misreading. Now let me read what's why it can't mean that. If it means that, you're in trouble at, at the Sham. Let me just read what he says here. Narrated by Al-Qasim, narrated by al Hussein, narrated by Hajjaj, narrated by Ibn Juraj, narrated by Mujahid, who related to Muhammad over means the Quran is a protector, a witness, and a confirmer. Confirmer. Okay, one more. It was narrated by Muhammad Ibn Sa'd, narrated by his father, narrated by his uncle, narrated by his father, Narrated by Ibn Abbas, Ibn Abbas, which you mentioned, Ibn Abbas, who stated that we brought down upon you the book, in truth, confirming what is between your hands from the book, refers to the Quran, which is a witness to the Torah and the Gospel, and confirms both of them. Muhammad over it means a guardian over it, judging over the books that came before it. So that's Ibn Abbas. But you know what? what's also amazing, Itisham? One of the other views by the scholars, one of the other views, is that it refers to Muhammad being Muhammad over the Quran. Let me read it. Others have said that we brought down upon you the book confirming what is between your hands before the book refers to the Prophet of Allah. Of those who mentioned this opinion are narrated by Al-Mahni, narrated by Abu Hudhaifa, narrated by Shibli, narrated by Ibn Abu Nujay, narrated by Mujahid, who stated Muhammad over it refers to Muhammad who was entrusted with the Quran. Muhammad means Muhammad was entrusted with the Quran. Now, Itisham, understand what they just said. Muhammad is Muhammad and over the Quran. They're saying that these scholars believe it's not the Quran that's Muhammad and over the Bible. It's Muhammad, Muhammad and over the Quran, meaning Muhammad was sent to guard the Quran. Are you seriously going to tell us that if Muhammad means what you said it meant? Because I want people to understand what you meant by Muhammad. Muhammad means the Quran is superior to the Bible. It makes the Bible obsolete. It does away with it. But here they said it's actually Muhammad. He's Muhammad of the Quran. So are you seriously going to tell me at Tisham? And I want everyone to hear this. Because Muhammad is Muhammadan, he's Muhammad of the Quran, meaning Muhammad now does away with the Quran, makes the Quran obsolete. It's of no use because he's Muhammad. You sure that's what it means? You positive that's no, what it means? That's your interpretation no, that's of it. And if you. And if you want me to give you further uh, Quranic verses, uh, no, the Quran stick chapter... 548. 548. We're not going everywhere. We're no, sticking with this talk, one. Let him talk, sir. Yeah, yeah, just let him stick with that one. Okay. All right. I mean, uh, that's your interpretation of it, right? Because uh, the Quran chapter 5, verse 48, 
is saying the Quran needs to be followed by everybody. You got to read the Quran in its proper. You can't just isolate Quranic verses, spin your own interpretations, and just uh, uh, run with it. You got to read the Quran and like when I read the New Testament, I re I try to read it in a, in its proper context. I don't I don't take things out of context anymore. I try to read it in its proper context. Uh, the Quran explains itself. So you got to look at other verses of the Quran. Other verses of the Quran says the Quran was revealed to everybody. Quran chapter 2, verse 185. Quran chapter 5, verse 68. Quran chapter 18, verse 54. Quran chapter 30, verse uh, 58. And Quran chapter 39, verse 27. So the Quran explains itself. You got to read other Quranic verses and then, uh, you know, and not just take things out of context and spin your own interpretations. If you do that with the Quran, I can do that with the Bible. And, you know, we're not, we're just not going to get any. Respond to that real quickly number one that's what you've been doing to the bible you did that to jeremiah 8 8 so you're doing the very thing to the bible that you say you wouldn't do and accuse me of doing that's number one number two that's not my interpretation i just quoted tabari let me read it again tabari tabari and al qurtubi says the same thing tabari let me read it one more time because you just said it's my interpretation let me read tabari he's not sam shimon he's not david wood he's not a christian okay others have said we brought down upon you the book in truth, confirming what is between your hands from the book, refers to the Prophet of Allah. Others have said, not Sam Shubu, not David Wood, not my mother, not his ancestor. Who are these others? Narrated by Al Mahni, narrated by Abu Hudhay uh, or uh, I'm sorry, Huhayfa, narrated by Shibli, narrated by Ibn Abu Nujay, narrated by Mujahid, who stated Muhammadan refers to Muhammad. No, that's not my interpretation. That's Tabari quoting these scholars saying that's what they believe, and Qurtubi cites the same scholars. Secondly, you said that's not the contextual meaning. If you read the Quran in context, it means everyone has to follow the Quran. No, that's not the contextual meaning. If you read 43 to 48, even the verse itself, what the saying is, the Jews go with the Torah, follow it. Christians follow the Gospel, and Muslims follow the Quran, was given to Muhammad, and let me prove it to you. The context says you're wrong, at Here's 548, the context. I'm just going to read the context. To you, we sent down the scripture in truth, confirming the scripture before it, guarding it in safety. Judge between them what, what Allah has revealed, and follow not their vain desires, diverging from the truth which has come to you. To each among you, Itisham, pay attention. This is the verse now. Yeah. To yeah. each among you, we have prescribed a law in an open way. If God had so willed, he would have made you a single people. It wasn't his will for us to be all Muslims or Christians. But his plan is to test you and what has been given to you. So strive as in a race and all virtues. The goal of all of you is to God. It is he that will show you the truth of the matters which you dispute. So it to Sham, the verse says that as far as Muhammad and his followers are believing in, they go by the Quran and use the Quran to determine which parts of the previous legislation is binding on them. But then it says to each one of you, who's each one of you? The Jews mentioned in 543 to 45. The Christians mentioned 46, 47. Each one of you, Muslims, Jews, and Christians, we gave you your own law, your own way. Follow it. And on the day of judgment, you'll answer to Allah. This is not my interpretation, Tisham. Do you have the study of the Quran? In the study Quran, written by Muslim scholars, open up chapter 5, verses 43, 48. In the study Quran, edited by Sayyid Hussein Nasir, not Sam Shumun, not Sam Shumun's grandfather. They say that that passage shows the Torah is valid, the gospel is valid, the Quran is valid, Torah is valid for Jews, follow it, gospel followed for, valid for Christians, follow it, Quran valid for Muslims, each respective community follows their own scripture legislation. That's the study Quran. So Tisham, I don't know how much wrong can you be. Open and read it for us. You have it now. Start reading 43 their comments and read 48 what it says. Read 48, see where I'm wrong, because I quote them in my article. Again, all your sources are on my side against you, Christ is Lord. And maybe tomorrow you can come back, we can do science and prophecy, because I want to do that, but it's already been over two hours. Uh, if you want the last word, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One, one, one second. I am going to give, I am going to give uh, the uh, Itishem the last, the last word on this, on this, uh, on this issue. But um, I did want to say, yeah, we, we didn't get to um, Muhammad fulfilling the biblical criteria of a prophet um by fulfilling pro by fulfilling prophecies and performing miracles uh we didn't get to um scientific accuracy of the quran moral problems with muhammad and whether it's it's uh it's fair for christians to point out problems with muhammad when we can see prophets in the bible uh doing many many uh many things that we would regard as wrong and uh that muhammad was sincere and that muhammad uh, didn't plagiarize sources. So Itishem brought all these up. We didn't. Uh, we didn't get to these. 
if Etesham wants, um, even on this issue, he can, he could, he could, he, uh, it's up to you, Etesham, if you want to come back tomorrow or a different day after you've read that passage, because, you know, we don't want to catch people on, on the spot and say, just read this, read this passage. You might want to uh, look at it yeah. closely and, and uh, so, so you can clarify your thoughts on it. But you can, you can read that now and, um, and discuss it. Or, it's up to him. He doesn't have yeah, to read or, it. Yeah, or, if, or if you want, you can come back and discuss that and, uh, and, you can discuss the rest of these issues and whatever your decision there, you get the final final thoughts on Surah 5, verse 48 and this discussion. All right. So first of all, I just want to say thank you for letting me have I I think this had I think this was productive. I think it's productive. You know, I am willing to leave Islam and become a Christian if anybody can prove that Jesus was resurrected and the New Testament is reliable. I'm willing to do that, right? So uh, so if you two want to have me back tomorrow, we can talk about crucifixion, resurrection, New Testament stuff. You can do that. We can set that up. Hopefully my laptop will be fixed and we won't have these issues again. But regarding what Sam Shamoon is saying, this is his interpretation of it. This is his uh, a misunderstanding of it. Because you got to read the Quran in its proper context, right? The Quran says it's for all mankind. Quran chapter 2, verse 185. Uh, the Quran says that we have set forth for mankind all parable, all manner of parables in this Quran, chapter 39, verse 27. The Quran, chapter 30, the Quran, chapter 30, verse 58 says, coin for mankind this Quran, all kinds of similitudes. Uh, you know, Quran, chapter 18, verse 54, the Quran is good for all mankind. So these verses, what other Muslim scholars say, not what Sam Shamoon's subjective reading of uh, scholars these Muslim scholars have taken this and taken these verses that I just cited and said that the Quran overthrows the Torah. It overthrows the gospel, and the Quran needs to be followed by everybody according to Quranic theology. Now, you could subjectively disagree with that, but that's Quranic theology, uh, correct Quranic uh, theology. Um, you know, so that's I'm not going to read the verse because I'm trying to save time. I know we've gone on for too long and uh, things like that. But my question is, what would make you two accept the prophet of Muhammad? Because you two have been going after Islam for years. So I just want to know what what would make you say that Muhammad is a true prophet? Because, again, you're Bible believing Christians. You, you have a standard to judge a prophet, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I think Prophet Muhammad, like the verses I cited, I think they um, point to the prophet of a positive case for the prophet of, of, of Muhammad. So what would make you change your mind saying that the that, that Muhammad is a uh, true prophet? I just want to know what your sincere, what would make you say that uh, Muhammad is a true prophet? Um, you know, uh, if I could just ask that last question. Well, from, from my perspective, um, I'd have to see that Christianity is false and that there are good arguments for Muhammad. But notice we're giving Muslims the opportunity right here uh, all week long. If they want to join us live, we're offering Muslims the opportunity to show us that they have good arguments for Muhammad and that they have good arguments showing that, uh, that the Quran is word of God, that Muhammad is a true prophet, that Islam is true. Um, given the arguments that I, I've seen for Islam, they, they seem to fall apart on, on, you know, on, on cl any sort of close examination. So that's basically what we're doing. We're giving Muslims an opportunity to show that. And, and not just for us. You could always say we're set in our ways or we're stubborn or something like that. But there are people in the chat who are watching as well. And so um, if a Muslim can make a good case for Muhammad, maybe there's a situation where Sam and I won't, won't, uh, won't think it's a good case, but someone else in the chat might think that there, there's an important point there. And that person might want to go and take a, take a closer look. So that's my perspective on that. What, what are your thoughts, Sam? Yeah, well, for me, if a Muslim wants me to become a Muslim, he's going to have to definitely convince me that the, that the Quran, Muhammad, taught the Bible has been corrupted, it's not preserved, it's not authoritative, it's not reliable, and it's not to be used as a reliable judge to live by and to judge him accordingly. So far, every attempt by Shabir Ali, Bassam Zawadi, and I have a challenge, Shabir, I hope he accepts my challenge, for debate challenge because he didn't do good in the first debate he won't do any better in the second and that's just my opinion i'm subjective but i want conclusive proof not snippets misquoting the quran misquoting the hadith making them say something they don't say i want someone who can clearly contextually show me muhammad said the bible as the jews and christians had it corrupt not reliable only bits and pieces are reliable then i'll then consider whether maybe muhammad 
can stand on his own merits. But if you're a Muslim, your prophet <clears throat> binds you to the Bible. So when you say the Bible's corrupt, you're convincing me all the more he's a false prophet. Because as far as I see, and no one has yet to refute me, maybe there'll be somewhere, someone in the future, Muhammad said the Bible's uncorrupt. But if you're, you're arguing and convincing me it's corrupt, I can never be a Muslim. So either I'll go become a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Gnostic or an atheist. Heck, I may follow apostate prophet. Because you as a Muslim cannot attack the Bible if you believe Muhammad. Now, if Itisham wants to come tomorrow and say Muhammad is a false prophet and antichrist, then we won't use him anymore. And we can talk about the evidence for Christianity. That's how you'll get me to consider Muhammad. If you can show me Muhammad thought, taught the Bible is corrupt, it's not preserved. So far, all the evidence you've given has failed miserably. Because that's not what he believed. That's just me. That's my position. All uh, right. And I would become a Christian. Oh, if I can just say one last sure, thing. Sure, I sure. would become a Christian if someone can convince me that Jesus was resurrected, the disciples believed that, the New Testament's reliable, and uh, things like okay. that. So I'm, it, can, it can work both ways. So I'm open. I, I had a challenge on my channels uh, telling any Christian to prove to me that Jesus was resurrected. Now, we can stop and convert to Christianity, but so far, you know, it's open. Uh, can I just make one comment to that? Sure. Yeah. 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 One comment. Uh, Sham, as yeah. far as you becoming Christian, that's okay. There is evidence where we can talk about it. But if you're going to be honest, you got to stop believing Muhammad. So you keep assuming that if Christianity is not proven, if so facto, you stay Muslim. No. Just because you're not convinced of Christianity doesn't mean you follow Muhammad. The only option you have, if you're going to be honest, because Muhammad confirmed the New Testament, which you keep attacking, saying it's not reliable. Give up on Muhammad. Say Muhammad is a false prophet. He was not a true prophet. Become an agnostic or an atheist. Then we can talk about evidence for New Testament. Now you're inconsistent. You're saying, I'll become a Christian if you convince me New Testament is true. Muhammad said the New Testament is true, even though you tried your best to show he didn't. Reject Muhammad, condemn him. So you keep thinking, well, as long as I'm not convinced Christianity is true, Islam is true. No. Christian and Islam can both be false. Maybe it's Buddhism. Stop being a Muslim. That's your first step. Then we can talk about the evidence for Christianity. So far, you're very inconsistent. No, right. it's, the other, it's the other way around. Prove to me Christianity is true, then I'll leave Islam. It's the other way around. No. It doesn't work. All right. That's just my thoughts. All right, All right guys, uh, just like to thank uh, Sam Shamoon and Etisham for uh, for joining us tonight. I will. I haven't added it yet, but I'll, I'll add links to both of their YouTube channels. Um, Etisham posts lots of videos. Sam does lots of live streams. So uh, the links to their YouTube uh, YouTube channels will be there right after uh, right after we finish this live stream, and um, again, this oh, is talked, what's that? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I forgot to mention. I talked to Shabir Ali. You said he doesn't want to debate Sam Shimon, so uh, okay. you okay. know you're, you're kind of say it all, again. Kind what of, did Shabir Ali said? He said he won't debate me. Yeah. Okay, so Shabir Ali yeah. uh, told you officially he won't debate me. Okay. That's good. I'll still yeah. chase after him, but thank you. All right, so. Um, so, but if any other Muslims out there would like to join us live, uh, one of you or, or two of you, if it's one of you, I'll probably you know just be a, be kind of a moderator, uh, maybe ask some questions along the way. If it's if it's uh, two of you who want to come on at the same time, that shouldn't be a problem. Um, this is Muhammad Week. Etisham mentioned uh, you know discussing the resurrection or something like that. Uh, shouldn't be a problem at some point in the future. But uh, if, if, if he wants to come back tomorrow and discuss these remaining points about Muhammad or someone else would like to discuss these arguments about Muhammad, that's what we're going to be focusing on this week. So uh, you Muslims out there, uh, either if you want to come on, you're welcome to do so. If you have your, your favorite Muslim apologist that you watch, you can contact him, ask him if he'd like to come on. Basically, 1.6 billion or so Muslims in the world, we're inviting uh, any, any one of them. Uh, from the least to the to the greatest in, in terms of knowledge, uh, to join us live and have a have a friendly discussion. So um, we'll be doing that all week. And if there's ever a night when we don't have a, a Muslim to join us, then then Sam and I will just discuss uh, points with the people in the chat. Did, did you have something you wanted to say, so, at the Sham? Yeah. So could you. Uh, so we we just tipped the we just touched the tip of the iceberg. You didn't even touch any of my other points. As no. I have other points. Uh, so can I come back tomorrow? Can we can we, can we discuss that? Hopefully yep. my laptop will be fixed by then. And yeah, come yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, yeah. So we'll we'll yeah. we'll start we'll start off kind of in the same way. We'll let you recap your your points that you made. But so so basically, the ones we discussed, you can skip those, and or, or if you want to mention them, oh. you can say, "Hey, we already talked about those. Go see that discussion." And your your other points, which we didn't get to, you can recap those for everyone, and then we can discuss those. So that would be on on the biblical criteria of a of a prophet and and things like that. Everything else you brought up, you want you want to come back tomorrow and discuss that? Oh uh, yeah, just uh, what time tomorrow? Uh, eight eight o'clock again, unless unless another night works better for you. 
Oh yeah, that 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 works. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm off. I'm off. I'm off work this entire week, so you know. Okay. All right. Well, good speaking oh. with you at the show. I like you, buddy. And God guide yeah. us all. Like you, buddy. I mean, I think we should just look, like they say in the X Files, right? The truth is out there. Mm -hmm. We should try to look for the. Uh, <laughs> I like that. the That's yeah. a pretty good example. Yeah, yeah and, and, and I'm a big sci-fi guy, you know. Yeah, and comic and stuff. Yeah, and guys, my, my yeah, my view is, uh, you know, we obviously have disagreements, and we want to, we obviously want to go after other, 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 you know, each other's positions and stuff. But it's always good if we can just get together, and uh, I think it's a good example for the world because for a lot of human history, people are killing each other, uh, killing each other over stuff. If we can actually sit down and say, hey, you want to disagree, then then let's disagree and have a discussion about it. And uh, people don't need to, to get physical over this stuff. Those are my thoughts. All right. Well, it looks like, uh, exactly. looks like Lord willing, all of us will be back tomorrow night to go through some of these uh, Etishem's other points. And again, any of you Muslims who want to join us or want to contact uh, Muslim apologists about joining us, uh, my email is, if you go on my YouTube channel and go to the About section, uh, you can click on my email there. Send me an email saying uh, saying that you want to uh, you want to join us, and we'll we'll see what we can set up. All right, catch everyone tomorrow.